Hello everyone, this is Thersites the Historian. I'm here with Sean Chick. Tonight we're looking at the 10 bloodiest battles of the American Civil War. And we'll go from least bloody, meaning the 10th most bloody, to the most bloody, and sort of give you a hint of what these battles look like, what the significance was strategically, and some of the major participants involved as well. Sean has studied a lot of these battles in a good deal of detail. And my favorite part of this episode is that I had to do zero prep work, which is always great. Um, also, one quick point. Somebody on Discord informed me that according to Transparency Tube, my channel apparently is a partisan right channel. Who would have thought? Yeah, it's based on a stupid what? algorithm. I know. It's based on it's based on an algorithm. I guess because I made all those videos that were critical of a lot of different Democratic candidates, they assume that I must be from the right. Even though all my critiques oh, are from the God. left, but whatever. Anyway, I just found that kind of amusing, and um, yeah. So transparency, transparency tube is what exactly? It's just thing which helps people to figure out the biases of different channels that make um, political content, and then somebody else had the opinion that maybe it's because I have a bunch of ancient history stuff and a lot of the people who do ancient history tend to be more right wing. I don't know. Anyway, kind of weird. I, I didn't know. I had no idea yeah. that, you know, I really loved the Republican party that much. News to me. Yeah. I, th I think also just like, it, it kind of goes in that, like, are you with us or against this thing? So if you're having yeah. these videos that are very critical of Joe Biden, right. And while you and me are both very critical of Trump, um, we're not like everything he does is vile, right? <laughs> yeah, I, know, I tend to see him more as a fairly typical Republican in most ways. Well, you, know, you got those people who think Jimmy Dore is like a right wing plant well, or something. The, the same people who, I mean, even Noam Chomsky's in that camp now. People who go around and say any vote for anybody other than Biden is a vote for Trump, which is a logical fallacy, and it's basically the same logic that Bush was using back during the War on Terror. You're either with us yeah. against, or you're for the terror. Oh, God. <laughs> Remember that? I mean, that's the same fucking logic. But anyway, let's not get yeah. too deep into that. I'm sure we'll end up back there somehow, because we always do. But uh, let's get into some gunpowder and um, whatever. Bayonets. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> right. So we're going to do the 10. Uh, these to be based on casualties, which means you know, killed, wounded, captured. But I'm not going to include people who surrendered. So Fort Donaldson's not going to be here, for instance, because, you know, the, I, the, I, I consider the surrender of the fort separate from the battle, if you will. Same thing with Vicksburg. So these will be the, uh, the actual actions with their losses, combined losses. Um, uh, being the supreme Civil War nerd that I am, I ranked the battles and have like a Word document for them. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, I have like ones for like, okay, so like what's the top 100? And, um, you know, it's also a way to compare them to to have the information so you can see state to state, year to year. Um, and also, I also have next to it who I would think of as the winner. So no such thing as a draw for me, I guess. There's at least one, I think, not every battle is a clear, clear winner, but I think there's always a person who's slightly favored. It's, it's very rare we get a true draw, right? Yeah, and I guess if you anyway. wanted to go deeper and you really had to find a winner... You could always talk about whose career benefited from it, even if it didn't necessarily help their side. Yeah, that might not be as much a thing in the Civil War, um, because, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, I don't think I don't think as much a thing in the Civil War, honestly. But I think for that you did that. I'm, I'm trying to say here, it's like something like that. It would be if they were looking to their political future, but even then, a draw wouldn't really help you. I can't really think of anybody whose career was enhanced by a draw, necessarily. Oh, I guess that's At least a war. fair. Yeah. But yeah, just anyway, so um, we can start off. Do you want me to list all ten of them first, and then we can go uh, down descending order? Actually, I think it'd be more fun to uh, have them as a surprise. Oh, ah, okay. Well, yeah, uh, keep everybody guessing, because I, I know there are some Antietam fans here, so we'll, uh, we'll see if <laughs> well, it makes it and where it, like, the, where it is on the list. Before mentioning number 10, I do want to mention the one that's number 11, but only by a nose, and that's Cold Harbor. Oh. 
So Cold Harbor is almost the 10th bloodiest battle. I mean, it's really, really close. But the one that takes it is Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg. I'm surprised that they were close because Fredericksburg, I thought, was on a much larger scale. Fredericksburg isn't much larger scale. The Union Army at Fredericksburg is massive, but most of it's unengaged. I mean, Fredericksburg really is a very ineptly handled battle. So anyway, here's the overall contours. Uh, Ambrose C. Burnside has become commander of the Army of the Potomac. He is ordered to attack, to, to have an offensive against Lee. He's taking the direct approach that Lincoln and Halleck want. Burnside, his plan was to outmarch Lee, reach the Rappahannock River, and get across it as fast as he could. The only problem is Halleck didn't have the pontoon boats ready. So Lee was able to get there in time to fortify the positions, and there are heights around Fredericksburg. So even when Burnside's able to cross, it he's he's uh, how could we say like he's, he's his army's kind of boxed in by Confederates who are on high ground. So he's in a very difficult position. But that said, attacks are very poorly coordinated. There's an attack in the south, uh, which involves George Meade's division. Meade does pierce the line, but he had no support, so it doesn't go anywhere. And then at Marie's Heights, a series of uncoordinated piecemeal attacks are made that are, uh, the, 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 it's a great slaughter. I mean, I think the, the loss ratio at Marie's Heights is roughly seven or eight Union casualties for every one Confederate. So also looking um, at the assault in the north, it says there's a sunken road and a wall protecting the Confederates. Stone wall, and yeah. also they're on a hill. Mm-hmm. And the, it looks like the well, Union also has to cross a canal as they're marching up. Yeah. To be fair to the hill, though, it's more like a gentle slope. So don't think of it as this is not a little round top. You're not going up some steep hill here. You know, it's much more gentle, if you will. Uh, but that said, it's 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 very good ground, very good ground for defense. Uh, the Union suffers heavy losses and then Burnside retreats the army across the river. Uh, some people consider Fredericksburg to be quite possibly the low point. It's definitely the low point for the Army of the Potomac, and it's arguably one of, if not the low point for the Union in the war. And if you were to identify the low points for the Union war effort, you would probably say summer of 1861 with battles like Bull Run and Wilson's Creek that are Confederate victories. There would also be the summer of 1862 when Lee takes command, so does Bragg, and both of them launch major offensives that impress into the North. Um... And then you have the winter of 1862 to 63, which involves Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, uh, Grant's initial failed attempts to take Vicksburg, the fact that Rosecrans is not able to press ahead in Middle Tennessee, and then the failed attempts to take Charleston. Uh, so the next one would be the summer of 1864, when Grant is being held up at Petersburg and Sherman is being held up at Atlanta, and the Confederates are winning battles elsewhere, such as Bright's Crossroads. Uh, so anyway, this is one of the low points of the Union war effort for sure. Um, it's hard to say that it's hard to say that a battle is easy, but I think Bruce Catton was right when he said, "Of all the battles Robert E. Lee fought, this is the one that always feels like it's done on autopilot." Yeah, it doesn't look like this one required a lot of brain power to figure out because uh, the Union kind of played right into his hand. Yeah, um, I guess it There's was also a little Lee... tougher on Jackson's front, though. Um, and you said Meade Definitely. as the division commander was probably the most successful here. Do you think that that played a role at Gettysburg in making him get tagged as the guy to command the army? Yes, definitely. Um, Meade's reputation after Fredericksburg in both armies went sky high. He was suddenly seen as a tactical wizard by some people. I believe D.H. Hill, the Confederate general, who was essentially a guy who liked nobody, thought Meade was by far the best combat officer they had. And that's particularly after Fredericksburg. I want to say Hill was nearby when that happened. So yeah, Meade's, <clears throat> Meade's high reputation as a tactician really comes from this battle. So another it's question odd. I have just looking at the map though. So it looks like the Union does have a lot of artillery up on the heights, the Stafford Heights. Um, yeah. Was that very effective at all during this battle or was it a little too far away? Uh, no, it's a little too far away. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. Of all the battles we're going to be talking about on this list, this is the only one I have not read a book on it. Like, I've read books that deal with it, say, like, Bruce Catton's Army of the Potomac Trilogy, Lee's Lieutenants, uh, but I've never read a book just about Fredericksburg. 
because it's like one of the least interesting battles of the Civil War. <laughs> yeah, I mean the casualty ratio is—it's almost like three to one for the overall casualty ratio. Was this also the battle that when Longstreet? Because I know he, one of his pieces of strategic advice is always let's get up on some high ground, dig in, and let them attack us. Would he just bring up Marie's Heights over and over as his example? Uh, yeah, he was impressed with it. This is the battle where Lee starts to take entrenchments seriously. And I don't mean that Lee never entrenched. Of course he did. But, you know, 1862 battles, armies didn't typically always entrench for a variety of reasons. The men weren't as well trained in it. Uh, there was a view with some people that entrenching would kind of dull the offensive spirit. Ah. But by the time you get to a battle like Fredericksburg, Lee sees how good an, uh, a fortified position holds out. So... This is really it's really after this battle that Lee starts entrenching and the Union as well that Joseph Hooker uh really became a fan of entrenching after what he saw at Fredericksburg. Uh so it, it's actually a very important battle for the tactical doctrines of the armies. Yeah, I guess Hooker probably took the worst beating of anybody or at least he had to be up there with Sumner. Mhm. Mm so the Union in the north they were advancing on a pretty narrow front it looks like. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, God. Okay, because I can see the artillery's lined up to hit them right as they're on the low ground. And they would have been right in the open, because once they got out of the town, there's no cover. No unit got within 50 yards of the Stonewall at Fredericksburg. Not a single unit. Mm -hmm. One interesting thing about it is that the the night of the battle, when it was over, uh, the Northern Lights were there. They had actually come down as far as Virginia, and the Confederates thought it was God celebrating their victory. <laughs> Yeah, Ken Burns snuck that into his documentary. That was a good touch. Uh, but there's also, of course, the uh, uh, Sergeant Kirkland of North Carolina, who famously went out there and provided water to wounded Union soldiers. He became known as the Angel of Marie's Heights. There's actually a statue to him at the battlefield. Uh, by the way, the battlefield of Fredericksburg is hilarious because this, the town it has, is built up over Marie's Heights. So all the national battlefield is is the Confederate positions, and when you look out over what was once that that gently sloping field, all you see is like buildings. Like I, I swear to God, I think I spotted McDonald's. You know, nothing like the Golden Arch to put you in the mood, right? You put you really make you feel like you're in the Civil War, huh? Exactly. So, what about down in on Jackson and uh, Franklin's front? I mean, has that developed too? Uh, there's some stuff for it, but I didn't have time to check it out. And keeping in mind too, like Fredericksburg was definitely the one I was like, all right, I'm gonna quickly check this out and. You know, this isn't Shiloh. I'm not captivated. Right. Um, I, I guess the other thing, uh, so it looks like the Confederates had their artillery pretty far forward, so I guess they were spraying canister and... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And ca canister is a longer range than you'd think, but of course, the closer in you get, the more devastating it is. Uh, there was also, the Confederates practiced something where, while one man was shooting, to make this almost like a... Like, to give an almost continuous fire effect... The second line would be loading the muskets and then handing it to the guy in the front, in some cases. So you're talking about almost a continuous sheet of flame coming out of that stone wall. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, the I, can wonder, why, I can see why you don't find this battle very interesting. This sounds like a turkey shoot. It is, it is. Uh, but that said, I do plan to read the main uh, one of the Fredericksburg books, because it has. There's like three or four books on this battle. So I do want to read one eventually. I just haven't rushed to get there yet. You know, I've been like, oh, I got to hurry and get a Fredericksburg book. You know, I'll read one eventually, though. Right. Well, um, I think that satisfies my curiosity on Fredericksburg. Uh, pretty interesting. Oh, should battle, be considering. should be noted. Oh, should be noted one thing about this battle. After this, there was a major spike of desertions in the Army of the Potomac, and keeping in mind. The Army of the Potomac wasn't particularly known for desertions. I mean, you know, but the, the, the reasons for that was not only the defeat, the three things, the defeat at Fredericksburg, Burnside did not handle his logistics very well, so the supply situation for the Army of the Potomac was actually pretty bad after Fredericksburg, and then the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, and a number of Union soldiers were like, all right, I'm not interested in this kind of war, so they left. Um, that, though, desertions due to the Emancipation Proclamation however, were more pronounced in the Western armies, particularly with Illinois and Kentucky regiments. Why Illinois? I mean, I can understand Kentucky because it was a border state, but... There's a region of southern Illinois called Egypt, and it has that name because there's a town there called Cairo, which they pronounce it Cairo. Because, you know, we're Americans, and we have to butcher 
names, right? Yeah. And also because it was described, you know, being at the confluence of both the Mississippi and the Ohio River, it was described as being similar to Egypt in the fact that the farmers there relied on seasonal floods. Oh. That area is populated by people who were of Southern descent. Economically, it was t- very closely tied to the slave states, and Southern Illinois used to have slaves in it as well. Um, Southern Illinois, uh, I don't, the exact numbers I don't know, but I actually just finished reading a book about uh, Southern Illinois guys who wanted to secede from the Union and instead joined the Confederate Army and formed a, a company in a Tennessee regiment, the 15th Tennessee. So the area was... Was that, that had a, there were regiments from that area deserted in mass once the Emancipation Proclamation was put in the books. In fact, two Illinois regiments from that area had to be disbanded because so many men left. Uh, so Southern Illinois, Kentucky, of course, being a, um, a, a slave state, and the people who in Kentucky who fought for the Union felt betrayed, like, hey, I was fighting for the Union. I didn't know you're going to free slaves. Uh, there was also a decent number of uh, desertions from Indiana regiments as well, uh, but anyway, so that's the Fred. That's the uh, stuff about Fredericksburg. Uh, you want to go on to the next battle now? Absolutely. Hmm. That would be Second Bull Run, also known as the most Napoleonic battle of the Civil War. So in this one, Robert E. Lee sent Jackson north because Jackson is very good when he's on his own. Uh, Jackson took on John Pope. He managed to win a victory at Cedar Mountain, although it wasn't a very impressive one. Um, Jackson then swung over, destroyed the Union supply base at Manassas Junction. Lee hurried over while Jackson was being attacked by Pope. Lee formed on Pope's flank and then smashed it and came fairly close to actually pulling off a double envelopment. Uh, This is typically cited as Robert E. Lee's greatest victory. It certainly uh, uh, greatly changed the strategic picture in Virginia and allowed him to press forward into Maryland, setting up Antietam, of course. Uh, I have read one book on this, book by uh, Hennessy, which is, I think it's called Return to Manassas. Very good book for the most part, although its coverage of events before and after the actual battle are pretty light. So like Cedar Mountain is done in a page or so. Because the author is trying to get to the actual battle itself as fast as he can. Um, Pope's attacks on Jackson were not very well coordinated. That said, Jackson actually didn't properly fortify his men, so they took surprisingly heavy losses on the line. One of the most famous incidents is when uh, the Louisiana regiment, when the, some of the Louisiana regiments actually ran out of ammunition, and so one Louisiana Confederate named O'Keefe grabbed a rock and threw it at the Union, and then suddenly the Confederates in the position just started throwing rocks, and. That didn't turn the Union back, but apparently the regiments that were advancing were at first so shocked they stopped for a few minutes to be like, wait, is this really happening? <laughs> uh, no. Eventually the Union attack was turned back, but this is considered this is like it's considered one of the most famous moments in the Army of the Northern Virginia. Anytime you have these old authors who would write books for the Army of Northern Virginia and treat it like this grand epic, this was always like one of the big, crucial, dramatic moments they had to retell, you know? Well, you know what they um, say. I guess Jackson's men took to heart that old saying, if you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, baffle them with your bullshit. In this case, if you <laughs> can't literally gun them down, just throw rocks at them and hope that they find that intimidating. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> baffle them with your bullshit. That's good, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it seemed like it was working for a few minutes from what you said, so... Maybe. Yeah, from what evidence the, the author said, like from what evidence we can glean, there was a minute or two where the union was like, "What? <laughs> like, really? This is occurring?" Yeah, somebody um, in chat said that they heard the union guys threw rocks back. Uh, wouldn't be surprised. I haven't read the second Bull Run book in a long time, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised about that one bit. I mean, in battles, you get all sorts of wild and weird shit, you know. Yeah, I guess this um, is one of those battles where both sides were regretting not spending more time trying to recruit Ballyark slingers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's pronounced Ballyark? Ballyark from the islands, yeah. Ballyark. Okay, I always called him Balearic. All right. I'm pretty sure it's Ballyark. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not disputing, man. I just, I looked at him and just went, okay, Balearic slingers, you know. But no, it's, 
it, it's it's the it's one of the uh, crucial uh, Confederate victories of the war. This is sometimes Second Bull Run, sometimes considered the actual true high water mark of the Confederacy. A very good case can be made for that. Um, it's very clear that after this battle, that this is really when Lee starts to get that reputation as a master, as a as a masterful commander, and a lot of you can hang his hat on Second Bull Run. That said, ultimately the trap was not shut. Pope's army did escape, a blasted as it was. I mean, such it's in such poor morale that. They didn't even really uh, send – a lot of the men were actually kept back in the defenses of Washington, D.C. after Second Bull Run. They weren't even considered uh, combat capable, some of them. So a considerable Confederate victory, a strategic victory too, but not the decisive not the decisive tactical victory that Lee was looking for. Although well, I guess, he came I guess it's, eight, a, it's a good thing that John Pope's headquarters were in his saddle because he had to get out of there in a hurry, so it kind of yeah. worked out. Fun fact about Pope, it's kind of weird. You'd think Pope might survive this because some men had survived much worse. And Pope, you know, had Halleck for an ally. I mean, when Halleck came west, he brought Pope with him. Pope was his man. If, in fact, I think if Pope had somehow won second Manassas, I think Halleck would have uh, been like, all right, we got to make this guy Pope like, uh, we got we got to broaden his powers, if you will. The reason is that apparently Pope... After the battle was told by Lincoln and Stanton, like, don't worry, we're going to give you another command. We're not getting rid of you. It didn't happen fast enough, and he apparently made attacks on Lincoln and Stanton in the newspapers. So that is apparently one of the reasons he was uh, shuffled off uh, to, the, to the northwest to go fight the uh, natives in Minnesota. But by the war's end, he's once again a high. He's, I mean, he's once again a uh, commander of the Department of Missouri, which at that point is a very important position because as the war is ending, if the war would drag out anywhere, it would drag out in that region. And of course, uh, after the war, he has a variety of high commands. So uh, while Pope's career didn't turn out the way he wanted to, honestly, he probably got away pretty easy. He also managed to blame Fitz John Porter for the defeat, which was fine with guys like Stanton because. Um, attacking Porter was a way to attack McClellan indirectly. Porter being uh, McClellan's protege. Right. Yeah, you got any thoughts on uh, Second Bull Run? Not necessarily. I mean, I know that, uh, I guess it was Lee's first great victory because seven days, while it did have strategic importance, it was pretty sloppy. So in terms of really establishing his credentials as a great general, I don't think it really helps the case much. But this battle certainly does. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it's an impressive one for sure, and he doubly so since they almost did close the trap, which is pretty shocking. We don't have uh, cavalry meant for a uh, pursuit. Also, I will. guess this wasn't this the victory which uh, led Lee to believe that an invasion of the North was practicable. Yes, well, the way he figured it is. Uh, the the Union morale was low. Now was the time to strike. The problem with that is that Lee's army had been almost continuously on the move and on the offensive at this point for weeks. So a lot of them were worn out. Harvest was coming up, so a lot of men wanted to go back for that. And there were some Confederate soldiers who said, I didn't sign up to invade the North. So there was actually a wave of desertions for Lee after uh, Second Bull Run when he went into Maryland. Yeah, he didn't waste too much time. Yes, I guess when he was at seven days, he had basically a horde. It wasn't weren't there over a hundred thousand men in the Confederate army? And then when he gets to Antietam, he's got what forty thousand at most. Yeah, I read eighty thousand. Uh, yeah, by the time he gets to Antietam, the problem with Antietam also is that his army was dispersed, and apparently after the after the after Antietam, like the day or two afterwards, lots of Confederates were actually coming in. So. Apparently, something like seven or eight thousand stragglers arrived in Lee's army, so almost made up for his losses. Hmm. Uh, so, a lot of Antietam's problem too was a straggling at that point. It was one of the reasons why he had so few men at the battle itself. Um, I think there's something else I want to say about Second Bull Run in particular. Um, it's not one of my favorite Civil War battles, but you know, I have read a a little bit about it. If you, well, I read the book on it, so you have that. And what is the book uh, on this battle? That's that's Return to Manassas by Hennessy. He also wrote a book on First Bull Run as well. Oh, that's what I want to say. 
Uh, seven days will not be on this list because I count those as separate battles. Ah, uh, but theoretically, okay. if they were added up, where would that place? Uh, I, the second bloodiest battle of the war. Oh. Uh, yeah, if you add them all up. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be held. Gaines Mill alone, you know, my list is the like 13th bloodiest battle. And that's just part of the seven days. Damn. All right. Uh, you want to go to the uh, next bad boy? Sure. Let's move on.org to the next battle. <laughs> move on.org. Are they still around? Uh, Yeah, I guess they are. I think. As far as I'm aware, they're around. It's funny how some organizations like that just seem to like disappear. Or, or they're around, but nobody cares. Anyways, uh, the next one I have is Antietam, which you said we have a lot of Antietam fans, huh? Well, we have one. But he's posted it a couple of times on here and then on another post somewhere else. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Antietam. This is this is a fascinating one because uh, George McClellan was put in command of the Army of the Potomac after... Well, technically he was still kind of in command during... Wasn't, wasn't Pope's Army called uh, Nor the Army of Virginia or some shit? It was. They were transferring McClellan's army slowly over to him. It was a very awkward, stupid situation. Anyway, Lincoln, against the advice of his cabinet, puts McClellan in command. And Lincoln's reason is he says that, hey, McClellan, I have a lot of problems with him. He says, but one thing he can do, he can whip an army into shape and the men love him. And we need that right now. Now, of course, McClellan found Lee's orders. One of some of his soldiers did. McClellan then marched on Lee's position. And actually did it much faster than Lee expected because Lee's plans were predicated on McClellan is kind of slow and the army's in bad shape so we can do what we want in Maryland for a while. So Lee is taken in many ways by surprise, fights the Battle of South Mountain, and now Lee is fighting Antietam. Now in some ways Lee's decision to fight Antietam is ridiculous. He only has one path of retreat over the river. His back is to, most of his back is to the river. The Antietam positions are not that, I mean, there are defensible parts to it, but it's not the greatest for defense, and Lee didn't fortify either. Uh, but what Lee was thinking was, if I can somehow beat McClellan here, we've got a major victory in northern soil, and this might cause Britain to recognize the Confederacy, because this is the height of Britain's interest in intervening in the war on the Confederacy side. Uh, the battle is not very well handled by McClellan. He attacks in many ways piecemeal. Uh, he held back uh, his reserve, the Fifth Corps, at a crucial time. Apparently, uh, Porter advised him to hold it back because it was the last reserve of the army. And that's probably, I mean, Porter was actually a pretty good general, but that's probably the worst advice he ever gave McClellan. Yeah, really the problem in Antietam is the piecemeal nature of the attacks. But the Union having the advantages of numbers, you know, some capable commanders, the fact that the terrain wasn't that great, that they caused significant losses to the Confederates in several, in several of the positions. Uh, the bloodiest part of Antietam is the fighting over the cornfield. There's also the famous attacks on the sunken road. And then there was Burnside taking the bridge and almost turning Lee's right flank. And then up came A.P. Hill with his division, and he saved the day, if you will. So Antietam, in many ways, was probably Lee's most difficult battle. And this was really the battle that, when I read about it, I started to question this idea of Lee being, like, a great genius. Like, I remember, I think Lee's a very good general, very talented. But one of the reasons I can't give him that kind of some kind of genius crown is because Antietam is a poorly conceived battle. You know, it's just, yeah. it's not a great, it's not a great place to fight. And if you're going to fight there, he should have dug in. And he wasn't really trapped there. He basically chose this position and waited several hours for McClellan to arrive and start to deploy. Yeah. I want to say he waited a day for McClellan, which is insane because this position sucks. It does. It does. Lee was also, I think, stopping because the stragglers were starting to come in, and so it was a good concentration point for that reason. But I think ultimately this was Lee saying, like, okay, I got to try. I, I want to try to get a victory. I'll try it here. Uh, he did not want to retreat across the river without bringing McClellan to battle. I understand some of the reason behind it, but goddamn, man, could you at least fortify the position? Yeah, you would think. 
And also, <clears throat> McClellan, so all his assaults were piecemeal, too. Yes, yes. So if he had uh, only coordinated his corps commanders, then most likely he would have crushed Lee's entire army. It is, it, it is, it is very possible. Uh, one may even say likely. Uh, that said, you know, tactical coordination was never McClellan's strong point. Uh, I mean, his, his handling of the Seven Days battles tactically was pretty poor. Uh, if anything, Antietam's an improvement, <laughs> if you ask me, over over some of the stuff he did outside of Richmond. And I know that I, I am more generous to McClellan than most, but that doesn't mean I think McClellan's a great or good general. Yeah, I just think McClellan had definite strengths and weaknesses, and one of the weaknesses is tactical coordination. Good organizer, though. Yes, yes, good organizer and great strategist. He's a great strategist, but he should hand over field command to someone else after he gets them to the battlefield. Yes, he really should have said, like, okay, you're in charge of the Army of the Potomac now. But no, no, he had he had been given command of the army. He saw the army as his own, so he had to keep command of the army in his mind. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, you got any... I don't know, hmm? the more I think about it, the more I think this is uh, the definition of an opportunity lost. Yeah, which is why the North had a... There was a there was a feeling in the north of how shall I say uh, or at least for Lincoln of like an opportunity lost. However, it's enough of a victory for the Emancipation Proclamation to yeah. be issued. So, in some ways, at least strategically, this is a decisive Union victory, even though it's a frustrating tactical battle. I mean, it, actually, if anything, tactically, uh, Lee won. He stopped McClellan's offensives and. McClellan didn't attack over the next two days. Morale and Lee's army shot up after that period. Now, Lee does retreat because it's the prudent thing to do when he does. But, you know, it, it's it's weird. It, it's it's like a tactical union defeat, uh, but definitely a strategic victory for them. And ultimately, strategic, strategic, strategic is what matters far more than tactical. So I, of course, rate a union victory. I agree. Um, it was a bad idea on Lee's part, and he was damn lucky to get out of there. Yeah, he was. He was. Like I said, I think this is his, I think this is one of his low points as a commander. I agree, um, and that's also why I think back when we were doing the Civil War tier ranking, um, yeah, I think we were right to not put him in S tier, and it's largely due to this battle more than anything else. Yeah, this one, of course, the uh, the big G, which we'll talk about later. The big G. Grant, you mean? Gettysburg. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. Okay. No, my, my, my friend Jordan likes to say that whenever Lee got across the Potomac, it's like he lost half of his sense. Um, I'm you know, some of that could... My strategic sense comes from my loyalty to the soil of the South, sir. So. I mean, there was, there's a case to be made that some of Lee's success in Virginia was partially like he knew the land. It helps out for sure. Could be. You know, it definitely helped with Confederate cavalry that they knew the terrain and the area. Uh, but anyway, you want to move on to the next one? Yes. What is after Antietam? So this would make it the ninth, or excuse me, seventh most bloody battle of the American Civil War. And that would be the Battle of Shiloh. But before I get in more Shiloh, no, no, no. It, it's pretty high, but it ain't the highest. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about Shiloh before we get any closer, though, there's some recent research that shows the losses at Shiloh are probably heavier than reported. And that's generally true of the Civil War anyway. Like, when you see these losses, don't take these as hard numbers. You should really be rounding up and down. But there's some evidence now that shows that the Confederate loss at Shiloh might have been two to 4,000 more men than reported. That Beauregard may have intentionally underreported his losses to impress both Jefferson Davis and to make the battle look better to the uh, to the uh, press and look worse for the northern press as well. So there's a possibility Shiloh should actually be higher, but, you know, I haven't really looked at the numbers on that one. So for now, we're going to keep it at its official total, which is around 23,000 casualties, um, veering towards 24,000. Anyway, uh, the Battle of Shiloh is the first massive battle of the Civil War, one that's on scale one whose carnage is on scale with the worst than Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it's also infamous in that most of the soldiers on both sides had never been in a battle before. 
Some Union and Confederate soldiers had been at, say, uh, Mill Springs, Belmont, and Fort Donaldson in particular. Uh, but, you know, the, it, it, what almost all those soldiers would mention after Shiloh is those battles were like skirmishes compared to it. So you have a lot of men who have never been in a battle, and this is their first taste of combat, and it's truly horrific. So the Confederate thing was to march on Grant's army and attack it by surprise. They were supposed to attack on April 4th. Uh, weather and traffic jams and bad orders meant they didn't attack until the morning of April 6th, which is really bad for them because by that time, Buell's army has arrived. The Confederate attacks are very poorly coordinated. It's a lot of frontal assaults that leads to heavy losses. But one of the things that really strikes me about Shiloh researching it is you have regiments in this battle that would do like, like Chalmers Brigade, one of the Confederate brigades was mostly Mississippi troops. They were involved in six separate assaults on this day. That's insane. And some of that has to do with these men being new to combat. So you, there's, this, there's this idea that when a unit is filled with too many veterans, those veterans know how to dodge danger, if you get what I'm trying to say. Right. Um, but that young soldiers who don't know any better may lack training, but they have enthusiasm. So I think that played a part of the Confederates. Also, there's this idea of, like, we're going to strike back the invader, and we're going to shove them away. And I think that's why the Confederates just kept pressing on constantly during this battle. Uh, but anyway, the losses are horrific. Most of the battle was fought in very, very difficult terrain. The battlefield of Shiloh itself was bounded by creeks and, of course, the Tennessee River. Uh, you got to tax up wooded hills. Now, I say wooded, keep something in mind back then. When you go to Shiloh now, the woods are very, very tangled. That's because it's a lot of second-growth forest. The woods were much more open at Shiloh. Not everywhere, but they were much more open. So a lot of artillery pieces, for instance, were firing through the forest because they could still see their enemy past the trees. So a lot of open woods, but still, that wooded terrain does break things up. Lots of marshes, creeks, a variety of ravines crisscross the area, too. So some absolutely creeks, terrible. Some which look pretty mild on this map, some of them are relatively deep, and some of them have a current, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Owl Creek and Snake Creek are pretty deep, and both of those are bounded by a lot of swamp as well. And not only that, a ravine. So, like, uh, I think it's on the, um, let me see, the uh, western portion of the battlefield when you, you get to this area where they said it was almost like a cliff drop-off into a swamp, and then there was Owl Creek just beyond that. So some very, very difficult terrain. Uh, by the way, this is the battle I by far know the most about. I'm writing two books about it right now. My bibliography is probably going to be like 70 pages long, maybe 75 pages. I mean, I'm just doing a ton of research on this, trying to write the ultimate Shiloh book, and then, of course, the maps of Shiloh, which will follow the battle piece by piece. So this is the one that I know to in, in its insane detail. Uh, one fascinating thing about Shiloh, too, is all the controversies about it, both north and south. So for the Confederates, there was this idea that if Johnston, Johnston's death slowed down the attacks, and they would have won if, they, if Beauregard had not called off the dusk attack at Pittsburgh Landing. Um... This most people don't agree with this analysis because the terrain at Dill Branch near the near Pittsburgh Landing is very very difficult, and I've seen it, man. It is difficult. That is a that would be a hard position to attack. Also, Grant and his chief of staff Webster had lined up a lot of cannons in the area, um, and also Buell's men were starting to arrive too. So, the idea this attack would have somehow carried the position would probably not have done that. Now, that said, the landing was a perfect picture of chaos. You had an estimated 10,000 stragglers on the riverbanks. I mean, the, the guys on the, on the steamboats, men were swimming up to the steamboats trying to get on them, and the men were just, like, knocking them back into the river. There's accounts of men being shot at the riverbanks as well. I remember, uh, oh, yeah, I remember reading that the, um, when the Army of the Ohio arrived and their, their boat landed, uh, General Nelson He's, when he got to the got to the banks, like all the stragglers were crowding around his men, so he leapt off on his horse, told his men to fix bayonets, and said, if they won't get out of the way, then run the bastards through. Uh, so anyway, the controversy for the Union is, of course, were they surprised? Uh, this is a difficult question in some ways. Uh, a historian like Timothy B. Smith 
would say that they weren't really surprised, surprised, because it wasn't like they, they, the Confederates weren't bandaging them inside their tents. When the Confederates attacked the Union position, the Union soldiers are drawn up in battle array, ready to receive them. However, it's definitely a, it may not be a tactical surprise in that sense, but I definitely say it's a surprise. The Union is caught out of position. Uh, you had officers like Sherman and Prentess, who are the frontline division commanders, who were openly ignoring all the warnings of the Confederates from nearby. So the Union Army was taken out of position. The men who woke up that morning in the, towards the rear of the camp were, were not expecting a battle. The idea of the Confederates from nearby was simply a camp rumor. Uh, the other controversy is... Did Buell's army save Grant's army? On April 6th, they didn't. However, uh, I find a lot of recent historians really downplay Buell's part at Shiloh and say, oh, Grant could have won without him. I'm like, that is bullshit. That is a big, steaming hunk of bullshit, okay? Buell brought 13,000 fresh, well-drilled soldiers. The only reinforcements Beauregard received were like 700 worn-out Tennessee men armed with like shotguns. Um, so I mean, if those Buell's, are Tennessee volunteers, though, you know, those are uh, <laughs> some crack troops, the poor 47th Tennessee infantry. But anyway, the Buell's men, are they needed to, to save Grant's on April 6th? No. I mean, they helped out, but they were not decisive. However, could Grant have attacked on April 7th and beaten Beauregard? Probably not. As it is, the Confederates on April 7th put up a pretty damn good fight considering they were tired, they had already taken heavy losses, and they weren't expecting to defend themselves either. So all things considered, they put up a pretty damn good fight on April 7th. Uh, I really don't think that Grant's men... I mean, Grant's men didn't do well on April 7th. They fled the field in several cases. Why? Because his men were unnerved. They'd taken heavy, heavy losses. Um, now, granted, Grant did receive reinforcements from his own army that being lou wallace's division which did pretty well on april 7th but still i i this idea that somehow grant would have won on april 7th without buell i think is very very silly uh buell to me is the decisive element of shiloh so without him being buell, there um would grant have had to stay on the defensive i mean he claims he wanted to attack the only thing with that is that there's not much indication that he gave orders to attack until the morning and when he did he didn't give precise orders. He just said attack. Because keeping in mind, Grant's weak point is he's not a master tactician. And his idea of attack is always just shove forward. So would he have attacked on April 7th? I think so. Because what he told people then, and it makes sense, is that he said Fort Donaldson taught him that you know, if, at a moment like that, he that attacks and takes the initiative has got a good chance of winning. And keep in mind, I think Fort Donaldson is one of Grant's finest hours. Shiloh, though, he would have been attacking a much better-led Confederate army, one that had, that considered itself victorious on April 6th, and one that put up a really hard fight on April 7th. So I think Grant probably would have attacked on April 7th, and his men would have been chewed to pieces. And uh, how the battle went from there, I don't know. Because on the other ledger, let's say Grant attacks, his men get chewed up. They can always fall back to the ravines, which are very strong defensive position. And the Confederates, it's not like they're in great shape, so who knows if they can storm the position. Uh, but I would say that I, on April 7th, I would give the edge to the Confederates. Yeah, and I mean, I just, haven't been to nearly as many of these fields as you've been to, and I don't know how many cannons were actually at the battle, but I know if you visit the battlefield today, it is bristling with cannons. And most yeah, of them pointed but, at the, in the direction of the Confederates. So had they advanced up to Pittsburgh Landing... There was basically a solid wall of cannons waiting for them. Yes. That said, the Confederates could have attacked elsewhere. They'd have to attack at Dill Branch. Dill Branch was the strongest position. But if they'd attacked at the uh, Tigelum Branch or some of the other places, there actually was a weak spot in, in Grant's lines that uh, uh, Claiborne actually exploited on April 6th. It's an under-discussed part of the battle. But he actually exploited a weak part in Grant's line, and helped roll up uh, McClernand's division. It's a very underrated part of the battle. Claiborne's brigade, undermanned, actually managed to rout an entire Union division just by playing on its flank. Damn. But, I mean, that's my point. The Union Army's in bad condition. 
A lot of these men have run to the river. They're unnerved. They're low on supplies. And sure, the artillery's massed at Pittsburgh Landing, but what about elsewhere? That's another problem with the battle, too. Uh, a lot of the Union artillery was not at the very front with Prentess and Sherman. It was in the rear. Yeah, I remember, I think, when we went there, we walked the uh, we walked from where the initial attacks were made on April 6th all the way to where the Union eventually solidified their line. It's a pretty good walk. We drove that we one. Actually we did drive. These... Yeah, it was a... Well, how many yeah. miles was it? Like... It's, it's as far. We walked along Sunken Road a lot, and we walked along the main Confederate battery. That's a fun thing about Shiloh, too. Uh, the Confederates at one point massed their artillery, 50-plus cannons. It's the first grand barrage of the Civil War. Uh, I mention that because in researching this, Confederate uh, artillery doesn't have the best reputation, especially in the Army of Tennessee in the Western Theater. But I have to say, I actually think the Confederate artillery outdid the Union artillery at Shiloh. Like, there's multiple times when they won duels, uh, provided very effective fire support. I actually think Shiloh, comically enough, is the high tide of the Confederate artillery in the West. Oh, really? Yeah. One problem I think they ran into later on was a lot of these really good, art a lot of the really good battery commanders at Shiloh, the Confederates had, uh, many, some of them resigned, were transferred over, or died after the battle. So a lot of the guys who really did very well here were never another battle again. So it's kind of like their, their, their core of artillery leadership took a lot of hits after the battle, and that I actually argue my book might be one of the reasons why the artillery underperformed as, as the war went on. But anyway, uh, no, so I would say Buell is the decisive element of the battle. Uh, that said, I mean, could Grant have won on April 7th? Certainly. He's not a terrible general. He's a hard-fighting guy, and they could have still fallen back to the ravines. I give a slight edge to the Confederates, though, considering their morale and that Beauregard is a good general and... Uh, very inspiring to the troops, and the Union was just in a bad position. I mean, when you read contemporary letters, the Union soldiers are very clear. When Buell arrives, they know they've won, and their morale shoots up. Before that, they're in pretty bad shape. However, since Grant and Buell tried to undermine each other after the war, it's only post-war that the that Grant's aren't Grant's soldiers, because the letters at the time are very clear about this. You know, Buell was a savior. After the war, they try to say, oh, we didn't need Buell. Um, because it's all part of pe it's all part of petty squabbling over you know laurels, right? And I guess we've already talked about the Grant Click and all of that stuff before, at least in passing. Oh yeah, and you I mean like they'll be like, oh, we weren't surprised or something. Sherman constantly said that it was never surprised, which is absolutely ridiculous. Wasn't he um, one of the guys who was on the leading edge of getting pushed back in the first opening uh, rounds of the battle? He's one of the first guys attacked. Uh, one of the first casualties of the battle is uh, one of uh, Sherman's orderlies who was killed. Uh, Sherman was shot at. He actually took buckshot in the hand. And Sherman did very, very well at Shiloh once the shooting started. I'd honestly say that on the tactical level, this might actually be his finest performance of the war. I mean, he did very, very well. Rallying men, made several determined stands, uh, led a counterattack on the afternoon of April 6th was part of the attacks on April 7th as well. So I'd say Sherman did exceptionally well at Shiloh. Oh. Except for before the battle, when he ignores every piece of evidence that says, hey, the Confederates are nearby. So uh, another commander I'd like to ask about is uh, Breckenridge here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Because we're going to be talking about him in our next video since he ran for president and lost. So it looks like he covered the retreat on April 7th. How did he function as a rear guard? Was he in A level, or how did he do? Uh, very effectively, but to be fair, the Union really didn't do much pursuing. Uh, uh, one of the one of Buell's divisions followed, that being Wood's division, and Grant sent some of Sherman's men to follow, which is a kind of a curious choice, considering Sherman's division is pretty chewed up, right? But hey, uh, but um, he did he did very well in that capacity. He was able to keep his two brigades together. Uh, that said, most of the rear guard fighting was done by the cavalry. Like, famously, Forrest charged Sherman's men with some help for the Texas Rangers. And I just found out that uh, some of Morgan's Kentucky cavalry also skirmished with um, with the Union advanced groups as well successfully. So was, the cavalry was really more involved. Uh, Breckenridge did pretty well in the battle, but Breckenridge wasn't very good at coordination. And that was kind of the thing of Breckenridge. He's, he was a very inspirational 
commander beloved by his men. Uh, I, I would rate him as one of the most popular officers in the entire Confederacy. One reason is that he did not see, he, he didn't treat his men as just mere privates to follow orders, but he said, I treat my men as gentlemen. Um, even famously, uh, when a lieutenant scolded a private, he thought the lieutenant was in the wrong, so he had the lieutenant clean up the private's tent. Um, yeah, no, I mean, but he's beloved by his men, but... You know, division command is about his mental capacity, and at Shiloh, he really wasn't able to hold his command together very effectively. Uh, so, I wouldn't say he was terrible at the battle; I just wasn't some kind of great genius about it. Of course, you have Albert Sidney Johnston himself, who was very, you know, heroic and bold the entire time, which is why he gets killed. Um, you know, when you're when you're running around the front one, when, you, when you're like over six feet tall on a giant horse running around the battlefield looking like an obvious heroic commander. You tend to get picked off, right? Right. Yeah. The belief, the, the, the common belief is that Johnston was probably killed by an Illinois sharpshooter. And then, of course, he a lot of, uh, Do you think Johnston was inspired and other generals this era were inspired by the example of George Washington, who was always out in front, even though he was a huge guy and he never got hit? Yeah, in part. Although I would say Washington, Washington could be bold, but he wasn't bold all the time, right? Like Washington wasn't like every chance he gets, he's like, "I'm gonna go go get shot at," right? Yeah. Uh, Johnston, I don't want to say he was asking for it, but man, he's really up in the front lines. There's one case where an officer goes to Johnston and says, "You need to come back." You know, they we're under fire, and Johnston instead just got closer, like almost active defiance, if you will. Uh, it was found that he'd actually been hit three times and his uniform was nicked in several places as well. Damn. But, I mean, the man's utterly fearless, very good at, you know, rallying the troops and getting them to attack. Uh, famously, of course, he was, uh, what's the line he had? He, he looked at uh, the Missouri troops and he said, uh, he looked at the bayonets, clanked the bayonets and said, these must do the work. And he said, men of, uh, men of Arkansas and Missouri, I want you to show General Beauregard and Bragg what you can do with your toothpicks. And by toothpicks, he means Bowie knives. Oh, shit. Yeah, I got, it's great stuff, man. <laughs> Very heroic. Um, Grant was also at the front lines, too. Uh, McPherson, who was nearby, actually got a horse uh, hit by a cannonball and blown out from under him. So Grant at one time had to hide out in a cabin while the Confederates were shelling the position. Uh, so Grant was at the front lines, too. Grant actually uncharacteristically even led a charge at the end of the battle. Damn. Very uncharacteristic of Grant. And I say uncharacteristic of Grant. That doesn't mean Grant's a coward or anything. Grant had shown himself to be a very heroic officer, both in Mexico and at Belmont. But Grant tended to just kind of stay in the rear and, you know, give whatever orders or direction from there. Shiloh's a rare case where Grant rode all along the front lines spoke with every division commander, and himself came under fire repeatedly. And, of course, like I said, led a charge at the end of the battle, which really got inflated by newspaper reporters later on. Um, uh, I know in John Keegan's book on command, it was called Face a Command or something like that, he said that Grant was the inventor of the modern command style of staying in the rear. Uh, no. Well, anyway, that's what Keegan said. Or either he's the best early example, something along those lines. I would say Genghis Khan is. It's his uh, his great examples were Alexander for heroic leadership, which I think is an accurate one. Um, he says there's an anti-hero method of leadership exemplified by Wellington. Not really sure exactly what he meant by anti-hero. I don't think he explained it very well. Then Grant was more of the modern commander. And then there's another step which is i think eisenhower or somebody like that who commands from way on high uh yeah i um didn't like that book i mean to be fair i haven't liked any of keegan's books his civil war book was pretty awful uh i think the best one is the one he cut his teeth really got his fame from face of battle it's not even like I mean, it's not even like a favorite for mine of mine or anything, but I'll admit, like it's got moments that are very well written and moments of some good insight. I do think that's a good book, but I just think the guy just kind of rode that out for the rest of his life, you know? Yeah, 
He wrote a lot of, about a lot of different topics and used his name recognition to get stuff published. Uh, he also published a book on the Iraq War, which was not very yes. good. And also it predicted very, that very, it had been a great success because, you know, th- things go into publication and can't be edited for several months before they're published. So he just knew about Iraqi freedom. He didn't know about the insurgency. So when his book came out, the war had already gone to shit. But he was talking about what a yeah. brilliant success it was and what a blueprint it was going forward. And that's also the famous book where he says that Britain is the world's premier second-rate power. And he says this proudly and unironically, which... It sounds like an insult, but it was meant as a compliment, as a patriotic uh, declaration of his love for Britain. We are the world's premier second-rate power. I guess it kind of is like... I mean, you know, Britain still has a good military, better than Germany right now. It's all right, we might be be second-rate. But we're at the top of the second rate. <laughs> I mean, come on, there's something to be said for that. Like, who's the best minor axes out, minor axes country in World War II, right? Is it Hungary? Is it Romania? It's got to be Finland. Finland is the premier axes minor power, right? I agree. In terms of allied minor powers, uh, hmm. I guess uh, probably the Free Polish. I don't know. Yeah, I'd go with that. That's cool. Up uh, Canada, Australia. Yeah, although now, I yeah, fuck, can no. I actually now that Canada? I didn't hadn't thought of Canada, but you're right. Canada or Australia would have to be it, just because of no, uh, go, how well their troops did and how many they had. I'll go with Australia. I mean the the variety of campaigns they're involved in, plus their plus the actions of their navy. I'll go with Australia, but yeah. I mean you know just just a subjective opinion. Sure. The uh, Shiloh, getting back to that one, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of co- a lot of controversies there involving uh, surprise, the death of Johnston, Beauregard's uh, decision not to attack at the end of April sixth, and of course, um, how much of how much did Buell contribute to the victory? Uh, oh, that's the one I mentioned though. If you look at soldiers' letters after Shiloh, they are really hard to Grant. I mean, they they talk about, they say Grant's played out, Grant's a disgrace, Grant should be removed. They really blamed Grant for being taken by surprise. And that should be kept in mind. Grant was not a beloved general. Like, charismatic battlefield leadership, never his thing. His men didn't cheer wildly when he rode by. He is not Johnston, Lee, Rosecrans, the other ones who are very popular. He is not that man. So the letters are the letters in his own army are very anti Grant, I'm finding, after the battle. Um, how does Grant survive Shiloh? Um, he's not given a ton of credit for the victory, understandably so, but in the end he chose not to retreat. So I think that was the, you know, he, he made one of the most crucial decisions, of course, you know, hold on and everything. Um, really what happened is Halleck and the thing is, Halleck's usually portrayed as like, oh, he he kicked Grant upstairs unfairly. And I'm like, no, no, Halleck kept Grant around, would seek his advice, and openly told people, I think Grant's a very good fighting general. But he didn't think he was a good administrator or strategist. And to be fair, Grant's staff work was pretty poor in 1862. Got a lot better in 1863. Yeah. But Halleck still thought Grant had some talent. And to be also to be fair, Grant was always sucking up to Halleck in 1862 constantly because Grant knew that was the man on the rise. And if you attach yourself to him, you can go places, you know? So yeah, I I would say that Halleck in some ways sidelined Grant, but also protected him from worse repercussions, if you will. Yeah. um, Halleck looks like he's afraid of the camera. I just pulled up a picture of him. And he just looks like he is afraid of the camera. He's looking right into it, and you can just see the discomfort on his face. Yeah, God, he's so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, all these, all these pictures, he just looks deeply out of sorts. And there are several different ones, but he has the same expression where he's just kind of uh, trying to pretend he's not there. And one of them, he's just looking off into the distance, uh, you know, in this I don't want to be here kind of face. I don't want to be here. Yeah, I mean, you can just you can just see the uh, the lack of charisma in his face too. You know. Yeah, I can't imagine if he was trying to lead a charge somewhere. That would be amazing. I guess uh, it's a good thing they kept him back in D.C. Not even that man. He turned out to be a 
not a very good strategist overall. Um, mostly when he would meddle with the other armies, it was to their detriment. I mean, hell, I mentioned Fredericksburg. You forgot to send the pontoons to the Rappahannock. But you know I me, mean, I don't have a very high opinion of uh, Henry Halleck. But anyway, that's Shiloh. Uh, I would say Union victory, but not as, I wouldn't overstate the victory too much, though. Uh, there was a lot of caution in the Union High Command post Shiloh in the West because of guys like Halleck and Buell. A lot of that had to do with being taken by surprise. This, led, of course, led to the very slow capture of Corinth and some strategic inaction after the fall of Corinth, Mississippi. In addition to that, the Confederates genuinely felt like they had won the battle but had only been defeated by gunboats and Buell. So one could argue that this may have even led to, I mean, it didn't seem to really hurt Confederate morale nearly as much. Their letters, they're pretty boastful. Like, yeah, we took them by surprise and kicked their asses until those gunboats started shooting at us, and then Buell arrived. Uh, so I think we should also know that the Union losses at Shiloh were so heavy that Halleck recalled John Pope's army from the Mississippi River to Pittsburgh Landing. John Pope at that time was taking Island Number 10, and if he hadn't done that, Pope could have actually went on and taken Memphis, which would have been much more strategically uh, viable than having his men be there for the investment of Corinth. So I think Shiloh, of course, a Union victory. I don't think it was a decisive Union victory. I could even make a case for it being kind of Pyrrhic, really. Huh. But in the end, the army survived uh, one hell of a test. Uh, we want to take a quick little break. I want to refill my uh, drink here. Well, we'll get some ice cubes, be more appropriate. And then we can get okay. to uh, number six. Sure. Um, I'll make a couple announcements while you're doing that. All right. Okay, so the last two weeks we've had prizes for the number one donor to the Super Chat, and neither winner has contacted me with their information so I can mail out their prize. So if you are the person who won last week or the week before, I know what your names are, but I won't announce them, add me on Discord. Link is in the description of the video. Send me a personal message with your details, and I will get your stuff in the mail to you. So, yeah, that is that. Also, remember, I have two other channels. WTF Gas Podcast and Spirit of Thersites. You can find those by going to my featured channels list. Pretty easy to do. Make sure you're subscribed. I still put out content on those channels as well. So, yeah, now you're all caught up on all of the housekeeping. Are we doing a uh, another giveaway? Another book giveaway for this one? Possibly. The problem is the two people who've won the last two weeks in a row have not yet claimed their stuff. By sending me their info, right. so I don't know if we could, if we should do it or not because I don't want to have a huge stack of stuff that is to be mailed. Well, you know, let's 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 do it for this one. We'll see, right? All right, we'll see. So everybody, whoever gets whoever most of the super chats, please ask any questions you have, uh, especially anything American Civil War related, since that is the topic at hand. Um, before we move on, do you have any opinions on Shiloh? Um, not all that many, I suppose. Um, I know that some people have tried to compare it to Marengo in terms of yes. this commander being taken by surprise, it being his worst battle, that being Grant. Um, what do you think of that comparison? I I do like it. I, I, I never liked it when you'd read books and they'd be like, oh, Grant's the anti-Napoleon. I'm like, oh, no, they've got a lot in common in many ways. Not maybe not personality-wise, but... As generals, they actually do have a decent amount in common. Yeah, when I was studying Marengo, when I was first reading Marengo, I was like, oh, this is like Shiloh for the Napoleonic Wars. And, you know, it's not Napoleon's best battle. Shiloh's not Grant's best battle. But they do show that that will and determination to win that's decisive to the to their success of both men. You know? Right. Um, I mean, hell, even at Marengo, uh, the, the Austrian commander wasn't killed, but he was wounded. Uh, General Mal Malas, Malaus, right? Kind of like almost like the Johnston thing in a way. Uh, so 
Oh, fun, another, another fun fact about Shiloh. The battle gets its name from the name of the church that was in the area. There were two churches in the area, Shiloh and Shakerag. Shakerag was a church, was a slave church. And Shakerag churches were all over the South at that time, even into the 20th century. Uh, I know Elvis apparently used to attend one. And they were called Shakerag because it was known for, like, lively celebrations, if you will. I Shiloh, I want to say, was a Baptist. Shakerag. That would be more fun. Shaker Ag Church. There wasn't as much fighting around there. Shiloh Church itself was a lot of fighting. Um, anyway, Shiloh Church. Um, the Shiloh is a reference to a town in Israel in the Old Testament. I believe that's the one where the kings of Israel were crowned, or something like that. So, um, a town, a town of, of of a lot of importance in the Bible. Um, so anyway, that's why Shiloh has this unusual name as compared to the other ones again Tedum's named after the creek so is bull run but shiloh it's it's um the name has a certain kind of uh, poetry to it that some of these other ones lack right right yeah so but anyway you want to move on to number six what is or do you have any thoughts six? on shiloh? i don't have any other shiloh ideas all right uh number six is stones river all right so that's yeah the also in tennessee that is also in Tennessee. The, the by the way, we only have like there's only three battles of the Western Theater on this list. The Western Theater battles did not tend to be the bloodbaths of the East. Uh, but although you know, you got ones like Stones River. Uh, Stones River is the one I joke about. It's the biggest battle of the Civil War that people don't talk about because Grant, Sherman, Lee, and Stonewall Jackson were not present. But if they had been, I'm sure we'd hear about it every day, wouldn't we? Undoubtedly. Still. Undoubtedly, although we have had, I mean, there's been three books on Stones River, including one by Larry J. Daniel that came out a few years back. But anyway, uh, Stones River takes place outside Murfreesboro. It's also known as by that name. What William Rosecrans took over what would eventually be called the Army of the Cumberland. It became known as the Army of the Cumberland shortly after this battle. He was ordered to attack. Um, he didn't really want to, but he decided to anyway. He felt the army was just ready enough and also... There was understanding that the Union needed a success because of the defeat at Fredericksburg. Uh, Rosecrans advanced on Bragg's position. The two armies got into position, and then both generals proceeded to attack the other one's right flank. But the Confederates attacked first. They attacked better, and they came fairly close to cutting off Rosecrans' main avenue of escape. I guess his main but avenue probably, would be the Nashville Turnpike? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he. I mean, he still could have made it out, but he'd been in a bad position. Uh, the Union right flank was taken by surprise. Actually, they were not. I mean, they knew the Confederates were nearby. It wasn't like Shiloh in that regard, but they were just. They were not well prepared. Is the best way to put it. So anyway, sorry. So anyway, right flank gets uh, crumpled up, but then the Confederate attacks. Some of them were piecemeal and poorly coordinated. Um, what else can be said for this? Uh, Rosecrans himself was very much on the front lines rallying the men. One could call this like his finest hour as a commander, at least a battlefield commander. And the Confederates lacked the reserves to really uh, gain the advantage at the end. So on January 2nd, like January 1st, because it's the main battle fought on December 31st, January 1st, there's, like, just skirmishing. January 2nd, Bragg launches a very foolish attack on Rosecrans' left flank. The uh, units that attack are slaughtered, and particularly the Kentucky Brigade. This is where they got their nickname, the Orphan Brigade, because apparently General Breckinridge rode amongst the men yelling, my orphans, my orphans, my poor orphans. Um, it's a crucial victory in that it gives Lincoln a win when he needs one with the Emancipation Proclamation coming in. It also gives him a win in the midst of a season of defeats, mostly Fredericksburg and Chickasaw Bayou, which is right outside Vicksburg. And the Confederate command structure in the West never recovers from this battle. You see, a lot of officers didn't like Bragg, but post-Perryville, there was a truce that was brokered by Jefferson Davis. This is one of his finer moments as a president, too. He came to the Army of Tennessee. He essentially spoke with Polk, who was his friend, and said, hey, I want you to really support Bragg here. At the same time, he was able to get Bragg to say, like, hey, Bragg, you might want to smooth over the edges. So essentially, Polk and Bragg declared a truce, and that truce was solidified in a grand party, which was held after John Hunt Morgan 
captured a Union garrison at Hartsville. And that truce is gone after Stones River. You know, Bragg blames... Bragg got blamed in the press for, like, winning a battle and then losing it suddenly. That's what they said un- unfavorably. Bragg then said, well, I was advised to do it by Polk. And Polk's like, well, don't blame me for the defeat. And then, even worse, Bragg sent out a circular to his officers saying, like, hey, who was responsible? F- who who agreed to the retreat? And who was responsible for it? But the circular also said this. One of the most pathetic things I've ever read from an army commander. Uh, do I have the confidence of the army? Dude, if you're asking that question, you don't. The officers replied, many officers replied back, you do not have the confidence of the army. Instead of Bragg resigning, he instead bullied and persecuted those officers who were honest with him. And that's one thing I've really come to see about Bragg as a person. He, um, we say that he was prickly. He was very... Uh, aware of his status and anybody who would encroach on his status and position, he would hold it against them bitterly. I mean, an example of that is that Shiloh, uh, one of the brigade commanders, he called him a coward and the guy wasn't, but the reason he did that is because only a few days before that, when Bragg blamed that officer for a traffic jam, that officer said, Hey, I didn't get any orders from you. That was a uh, general Gibson, Randall Gibson. So what can we say, man? Like Bragg is not the kind of guy you can go to and be honest. You got to lie to him, right? Yeah, Bragg God, is the kind prick, of guy man. who would have actually benefited from one of those uh, how to what was that book by Dale Carnegie? How to win friends and influence people. Yeah, yeah. On Rosecrans, on the on the other thing for Rosecrans, after Stones River, he becomes really popular, and I would actually say roughly from the Battle of Corinth until maybe May eighteen sixty three, Rosecrans is the premier hero in the North, the most popular officer they have. But the thing is, while Rosecrans had won Stones River, he knew he'd come close to defeat, and he also knew the Confederate cavalry had completely outshone his. They had wrecked his supplies. And they, I mean, like, seriously, they, they, they went into the rear and destroyed multiple baggage trains. So Rosecrans, after Stones River, became obsessed with the idea that my cavalry must be the best. So he used his newfound influence to secure a lot of weapons and horses, but he didn't advance, like, like by May 1863, you know, guys like Halleck in particular, like, hey, when are you going to advance? And he just delayed until late um, June. And I think that worked against Rosecrans. It would have been, I mean, he, he kept the army immobile for maybe a little too long. Now, granted, he was successful. When his army does move, his cavalry completely outdoes the Confederate ones. They actually win a battle at Shelbyville, which... It's rarely spoken about, but it's a swirling, dramatic cavalry fight. And it's one that it's actually one of the first times Union cavalry takes on the Confederate cavalry and beats the living hell out of them. Uh, so he was vindicated, but he waited too long. And then, of course, Gettysburg happens, Vicksburg falls. So Grant becomes the big hero of the hour, not Rosecrans. Um, so anyway, so Stones River, a fascinating battle, one of my favorite ones. Uh, sometimes consider writing a book about it, but I'm not sure. Uh, after Shiloh may um, Shiloh may kill my enthusiasm to ever want to do battlefield history again. I mean, I'm, 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 I like doing I, I like doing it, but I don't know if I want to. I mean, it's such a bear of a thing, you know, to like go through all of this, like to go through that many pages of documentation to try to get the tactical maneuverings precise, right? right. I mean, it's right. <laughs> it's not. Um, it's a tall fucking order. I think you should do a book on uh, the Hallett click because I know it's been an interest of yours and I guess there needs to be but, some pushback against the Grant fanboyism that's been going on. Well, I have considered writing a book about Grant's generalship to really discuss his strengths and weaknesses. Um, and the Hallett click argument would, would be part of such a book if I wrote it. I am going to write a little blog post about the emergence of a war. Uh, just to you know, throw it out there and see what people think. Anyway, you got any thoughts on Stones River? Not especially, no. Um, we did visit this place, though, right? We did, we did, man. We actually that's where we had the photo. Um, me, oh, it's like yeah. me, my brother, and it looks like an album cover. <laughs> yeah, it does. it's wearing the slaughter pen. <laughs> oh, right, the slaughter pen. I forgot what that was called, but that that was pretty cool. Um, is that was it at um, Murfreesboro or was it at Shiloh that Michael 
got bored and said that he just liked being outside, then he literally, after saying that, started skipping up a hill. Ooh. Ooh. Because it was one of uh, them. I think it was Stones River, man. Okay, so that was the most important thing that's ever happened at Stones River. Um, a grown man got bored with what he saw at the battlefield and started skipping up a hill. With no warning. He just did it. We had no idea it was coming. And I remember the three of us were just standing there dumbfounded while he was skipping up a hill. And I, I remember I turned to Danny and I said, this, this is happening, right? This is real? <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah. So I guess it was it's real. real. Um, you want to do some of the uh, super chats real quick here? Uh, sure. We've got three of them so far. We have one from <laughs> Michael Klein. Uh, did the Confederacy ever have plans to attack or at least cause problems in California? Uh, yeah, actually, you just sent me an article discussing this, the one called the Johnston Conspiracy. Oh, okay, uh, I didn't know what was in it. But... Yeah, the, the answer to this is yes and no. The actual formal Confederacy really didn't, but there were pro-secessionists in California. Uh, they... What happened is Albert Sidney Johnston was in charge in California in 1861. They knew that he was a state's rights man and that he considered Texas his home and Texas had seceded. So apparently they these men approached Johnston about allowing them to seize federal weapons so that California could secede from the Union. And by the way, their plans were kind of murky. It seems like they wanted to form a California republic that would be neutral in the war but favorable to the Confederacy, but some people wanted them to join the Confederacy. Anyway, Johnston told these men that he would defend the forts to the utmost, and to take those measures, he informed the governor about that, about the plot, I believe, but more importantly, he moved almost all of the weapons he had stored to Al Fort Alcatraz, which is today Alcatraz Island, you know, the famous prison in, in San Francisco. Well, he had all the weapons moved there where they were hardest to access. Now, there were rumors flying about that Johnston was pro-Confederate, which is one of the reasons why he was removed. Um, that said, Lincoln actually made it clear that, well, not Lincoln as much, but like Fitz John Porter, made it clear that if Johnston had stayed loyal to the Union, he would have been given a major army command. Uh, but he did not, of course. He went with the Confederates. Uh, he actually had to leave California and trek across the desert. His men, like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, avoiding dehydration and the Comanche and whatnot in order to get to Texas and then from there to the Confederacy. Anyway, those Confederate plotters not having the support of the army and then having the post reinforced gave up their plans. However, some of them did go uh, east and fight in the Confederate army. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I've only really just started diving into it. I mostly know Johnston's role in it, but it is interesting. And uh, fun fact, there's a part of California called the Alabama Hills. You heard of this area? I haven't. Yeah, it's a place in Southern California. It was used in a lot of filming of Westerns. And people thought, oh, Alabama Hills is the name of the state. It's like, no, no, it's actually named after the CSS Alabama. It was named by pro-Confederates who lived in the area and just thought that the fact the Alabama sank so many ships was awesome. <laughs> So yeah, that's the Alabama Hills for you. <laughs> it's named after the Confederate Raider. Um, wow. By the way, uh, real quick, uh, when, when Michael skipped up the hill, uh, how, did he get to the top? <laughs> I think so, yeah. It was a pretty long hill, but we were just standing there watching him for, I would say, two, three minutes solid. I, <laughs> I guess we were kind of Amazing. walking behind him, though, but still... Uh, yeah, he skipped all the way to the top, and I think when we got up there, he was just randomly sitting down looking at a flower or some shit. Um, it was the, probably the weirdest thing he's ever done, aside from that time he became obsessed with, uh, fixing the L.A. water problem that had already been fixed ten years before. Oh, yeah, God, no, I, I, Danny, Danny recalls that, he's like Michael being like, it's unlivable, I mean, it's unsustainable. <laughs> yeah, I remember, because he got obsessed with it, and for, for context, Michael was my roommate at the time, so I heard about this first, and I told Sean and Danny about the water thing, and I said, all right, so we're all hanging out tonight, whatever you do, don't mention the words L.A. or Hollywood, because otherwise you're going to get the most insufferable rant you've ever suffered in your life. Uh, and then Danny said okay i won't and then as soon as michael came there danny said michael uh 
What's your opinion of L.A.? Wow. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so inefficient the way that they handle water. It's just deeply inefficient, and they, it's unsustainable. Why would anybody want to live there when there are so many other great places you could live with better water? You could take all those people and relocate a lot of them to southern Indiana, southern Illinois. There's a lot of open country out there to be settled. <laughs> why, why not move from L.A.? Why not do like Bush did with the $300 tax rebate and give people a subsidy if they'll just move out of L.A.? And, and why wouldn't people not want to take that? Because L.A. sucks. Yeah. In there, it sucks. <laughs> it's not like Kansas City. And he said those no, words. No, no, I'm I... not shitting you. He said that he compared it negatively to Oklahoma City and Kansas City. Those are his examples of two pristine cities. Yeah, hey, I like Kansas City. <laughs> I mean, it's not bad um, or anything, but I, I, uh, he's the only person I've ever heard... Also, one time he learned that there was some firm that set up in Kansas City and then moved to New York, so that way the internet would be just a touch faster when they're doing uh, day trading, because those mm-hmm. fractions of seconds make a big difference when you're doing day trading. And he's like, he just sighed and shook his head as if they had done the dumbest thing anyone had ever done in their lives. He's like, I just don't understand why anybody would choose to live in New York rather than Kansas City. Kansas City is just such a m- much nicer place. Hey, that's 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 that that's what Michael likes. Um, and beyond that, I must say, uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of funny because everybody's really ragging on California lately, right? So I feel like Michael was really ahead of his time. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was it was an interesting discussion. And um, anyway, yeah, but I mean, I guess the only other Michael story I have is, uh, and I guess that completes the series. Also, when he decided to get married, he didn't tell anybody. He just popped up on Facebook one day. He's married. This is a few years after he uh, had left the program and gone as, gone to D.C. Because he actually had a dream of being a bureaucrat. No joke. He, he decided, after being in grad school for a few years, what he wanted to do is go to D.C. and be a bureaucrat. And uh, he did it, and then he met somebody, and they got married. And it just popped up. Married. Didn't tell any of his friends, really. Oh, man. <laughs> so. He he invited me to the wedding, but it was really, like, it really did come seem to come pretty fast, you know? But, uh, but no, anyway, man, he, no, he's a um, uh, good man, very intelligent, and uh, uh, he's, he told me the problem with being a bureaucrat in D.C. was you don't make enough money. It's probably true. No, yeah, yeah. Mike, Michael's a great guy. I mean, I'm just picking on him here, but I mean, like I said, yeah, he's my yeah. roommate. And, uh, <laughs> he actually uh, lives around here now, too. He came back to academia after uh, his failed experiment with D.C. bureaucracy, but uh, yeah, cool. Michael, Michael's a lot of fun. Um, also, some, yeah. when he plays board games, his strategy is somewhat frustrating because his turns last forever because he's very indecisive and he talks through his entire yeah. move, the logic of it in painstaking detail. So it's almost like psychological warfare against you unintentionally. He's gonna help me uh, transcribe some uh, some Shiloh stuff. I found a Confederate regimental report that was not that's not in the official records, which is great because you know you need every scrap you can get with some of the Confederates. Um, he's gonna help me transcribe it actually. Cool. All right, you gonna do the uh, what's the next chat? Uh, the next um, chat comes from um, guy. He said he doesn't have Discord, so don't worry about it. Um, just email me then. Um, I think you can access, you can find my email by going to my channel description, um, and then you just send an email, send me your address, and I'll get your prize, which is R- Red Dawn and Navy Seals in the mail. Oh man, Swayze all over yeah, the place, right? I know, and a, t- a twosome. Although it's more Sheen than Swayze because Sheen is the, in both of them. So you get Tiger Blood oh, and Adonis DNA. Them. Oh man, God, yeah, fuck yeah, you get Swayze and Sheen. Yeah, Isn't that Patrick Swayze movie you watch where it's like it's like a post-apocalyptic desert movie. It's like a lame Mad Max. Uh, I'm not sure what that one would be. I mean, he's in the. It Warriors. wasn't very good. Man. It wasn't very good. But anyway, uh, thank you for the super chat. And are we doing a Vlad the Third did nothing wrong stream for Halloween? Uh, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna be working I'm gonna be working Halloween man. There's gonna be a lot of tours that night. I gotta do crime tour and stuff, you know. I mean, it sounds like uh, you already got it figured out though, so I don't really know what we had learned yeah, from I mean, that. I mean, I'm guessing Vlad the Third is Vlad the Impaler, right? Yep, the inspiration for Dracula. 
Yeah, I think he's one of the greatest uh, people who's ever lived, in my opinion, you know. Uh, which uh, leads us to the next Super Chat. Thank you very much. This is NP Level 5. Five dollars Canadian says, more like Vlad did the right thing. I agree, sir. I agree. Uh, uh, Romanians definitely agree. I mean, they have a what amounts to a Disney World that's Dracula themed, or at least Vlad themed, and it's right near Castle Dracula too. So it's one of those Fucking... things. As an American, it sounds really weird until you realize that for Romanians, he is basically a national hero. Yeah, and also like we say that, but it's like you've been to Mount Vernon before. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, I, Mount Vernon. We called it Mick Vernon's when we went there. It was like over ten years ago. I mean, it was very like come to George Washington's home, like really kind of hokey. There was even like this statue of like George and Martha walking with the kids behind them. I mean, very, very corny, you know. And, and don't get me wrong, it was very nice going to the home. It's it's very well situated, very pretty sites. You can go to Washington's grave. You see the uh, uh, the bed Washington died in, and of course the sash that he took from Braddock that had Braddock's blood on it that he kept his whole life. So it's 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 worth visiting. It's just that it's also very you know Disney fied as far as history goes. Uh, Monticello was far more respectful when I went there. Yeah. Also, for all the people who keep talking about a console list for a tier list video. I will eventually do something like that, but I will have to break it into some fairly small chronological segments to make that feasible. Another thing I've been working on in my spare time is I actually want to go through Three Kingdoms era historical figures from uh, the Chinese Three Kingdoms period. Mm. So I'm putting that together, and I don't know exactly when that will be ready, but that is definitely going to be a thing. And on my WTF Gas channel, another thing I've been working on is tier ranking videos for NBA teams by decade. So right now the one I'm working on is the Chicago Bulls in the 90s, literally every player who suited up. So okay, Bulls and Lakers I think from the could, 90s. I think Roman Consuls of the Second Punic War would be a great one. Yeah, I think so too. There are a few of those guys I want to read a little bit more about. And uh, that's definitely a good one. First Punic Wars, another one. Um, the conquest, sort of that period between the Gracchi um, and after the Second Punic War, so more or less the conquest of the East and uh, a lot of the wars in Spain. That's a good period too. Um, Late Republic, I could do a couple different ones for that because the evidence is so abundant. Early Empire, there are a lot of generals who did a fair amount of stuff for their emperors. So, yeah, there's a lot of different ones I could do for that. Uh, so Wait, that's uh, something that could I go on check. for a very long time. Have you done a video on uh, Pulcher, the one who threw the chickens into the ocean? I'm pretty sure I have. That's been a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure okay. I've done him. Yeah, okay, I, I gotta I, I, I gotta check that out then, you know. I I was telling Siegel about that over dinner, about the sacred chickens. <laughs> yeah. It's probably my second or third favorite ancient history story is the sacred chickens. <laughs> if they will not eat, they will drink. <laughs> yeah. And there's also Scipio Asina, Scipio the jackass from that same war. <laughs> so Great. It, it produced a lot of people who were yeah. beloved figures uh, in the Roman historical imagination. Well, what do you think of what do you think of that uh, you got those uh, those uh... Uh, Dark Ages kings like Ethelred the Unready. Um, I don't know that much about that period in terms of but, British history. But that name though, Ethelred the Unready. Also, uh, in France, they had Louis the Fat. <laughs> well, actually, being called fat or bald or whatever was not an insult. It was just uh, they didn't take it that way either. Um, it's just a description, and it's sort of it's sort of like you have to deal with a nickname like that until you accomplish something or fuck up. So if anything, yeah. you knew that you're not the most capable person in the world and they called you Sean the whatever and it was just making fun of some physical characteristic, you might as well just stick with that if you don't think you're going to be able to achieve anything. Because uh, it'd be better to be so-and-so the fat than so-and-so the inept or unready or whatever. Uh, Ethelred the unready, though, he, he was a bad king. That's, that's just I mean, a great the, the name. name tells you everything you need to know and it's also the just word unready is just so perfect as a descriptor. <laughs> and uh, somebody created a Twitter account right after Trump got elected called Donnie L. The Unready, and it uses a lot of um, sort of 
it sort of parodies the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and a lot of the events of that period. And he talks about Danish kings being losers for not knowing how to deal with floods and stuff like that. Oh, that one's amazing. No, yeah, that one's great. That's, He's that's like, pro- of all the of all the uh, Trump mockery that you know the post 2016 world has produced, that is probably the most clever and well done. Yeah, definitely. I like when he said about Canute on there. He's like, a Canute can't turn back the uh, ocean. Sad. Sad. What a loser. It's just water. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you ever want to do English Kings tier ranking, I'm actually not too bad on that one. Uh, but anyway, uh, you want to get back to the uh, Civil War battles, sir? Yes. Let us get to the next battle, number five. Uh, this would be the Battle of the Wilderness. Uh, the Battle of the... By the way, these next three all happened within about four or five miles of each other. Or about ten miles of each other. Ridiculous, huh? So probably so, the bloodiest area code in American history? Yes, definitely. And also, it's the... That area of the National Park Service is one of the... Uh, lar- I think it's like the largest battlefield park in America. Because it encompasses, it actually handles four different battles, which we already did one of them, Fredericksburg. But anyway, the wilderness. The wilderness has its name because it was named for a tangled bit of woods across the Rapidan River, where a lot of the woods have been had been cut down, and they had second growth forest. Uh, the battle of the wilderness itself was a very very savage fight. What happened is that Grant and Meade crossed the Rapidan River. They found that Lee was on their flank, and instead of trying to get out of the wilderness, because the idea was get out of the wilderness where the terrain favors the defense, and get out of the wilderness and fight Lee on more open ground, instead Grant said, "Ah, eh, fuck it, Lee's here. Let's go fight him. Uh, I consider this one of Grant's biggest mistakes as a general. The, de- the, the, the ground favors the defensive. Grant's initial attacks are s- absolute slaughters. That said, on the right flank, Grant does have some success, but the next day, Lee attacks and actually crumples both of Grant's flanks. And I would say if Lee had maybe 10,000 more men, he might have actually routed the Army of the Potomac. So basically, I mean, they were Longstreet bad... had, wasn't in Tennessee. No, Longstreet was there for it. Actually, Longstreet's the one who orchestrated one of the flank attacks. Oh, right, right. He wasn't there for Chancellorsville. Sorry, I just got confused. Right. It's, it's the same map, but I guess that makes sense because it's fought at the same area. Yeah, yeah. So they're not too far from each other, but uh, the Battle of the Wilderness is fought uh, to the little to the west of Chancellorsville. Chancellorsville. Anyway, uh, one story has it that Grant had something of a nervous breakdown and went to his tent and wept, uh, partially the heavy losses, but also the realization that, oh God, I'm in Virginia fighting somebody who knows what he's doing. Like. You know, it, it's really easy to pick on John Floyd and Pemberton, but Robert E. Lee is neither one of those men. Um, so, do you think Grant was afraid of being exposed, or no? I think he just realized, like, I think he realized that he had made a mistake in attacking Lee, where he did. And the army had suffered very heavy losses, and it was very obvious that Lee. I mean, it's very obvious you are not in Tennessee, you are not in Mississippi, you are in Virginia. And it's going to be a hard road. Um, a very, very horrendous battle. That said, uh, the current literature in the wilderness portrays it as a draw or Union victory because Grant kept moving on. Uh, I consider this a Confederate victory. The Union Army of the Potomac's morale takes a big hit afterwards, and Grant has been defeated in the battlefield. However, Grant ignores the defeat and moves south. That is an important moment in Grant's career and in the campaign. So I just view the wilderness as a battle Grant lost, and then he ignored the loss and kept moving on. That's really what it is. Um, but anyway, no, it's just the uh, the generalship was not very good in the wilderness. Uh, Grant's army kind of got chewed up for no real result. Uh, yeah, heavy losses. Morale was shaken. Um and he's fought like one of the bloodiest battles of the war right then and there. But don't worry, the next battle is even bloodier than the wilderness. Great. Also, w- weren't there fires that broke out during the fighting in the wilderness? Oh, yeah. Anytime you had a fight in those woods, like you had fires that broke out in Shiloh that burned up men as well. 
God, I found one. I've, I read one graphic account that one soldier left. It was Ambrose Bierce left about walking past burnt out corpses at Shiloh on April 7th. Uh, but yeah, there were high fires, numerous fires that broke out and burned men alive. I remember Ed Bars, the great Ed Bars, he recently died, uh, said in Ken Burns' Civil War that the wilderness was probably the worst battle of the Civil War, given the terrain and the the terrain, the horrible losses, and the fact that many men did burn alive. And a very confusing, very, very confusing fight. Wilderness has also been called the closest the Civil War gets to Vietnam. Like, and just how much the uh, the terrain obscured where your enemy was located. Yeah. So, uh, didn't you say that at the building that Grant uses as headquarters, there's now a McDonald's, but it's Civil War themed? Yeah, this was in the 2000 and, uh, what year, 2008, I went by there. Or was it? 2000? No, 2007, sorry. So, there's, like, the Wilderness McDonald's. And inside, it has like Civil War art, like like metal, like metal cannon art, if you will, and like Civil War pictures. And it's near where Grant's headquarters is located. So my theory is is that they couldn't get the land to put up national park stuff there. The preservationists couldn't get the land, but McDonald's is kind of like an olive branch because historic preservationists back then kind of had moral high ground, if you will. They've they've taken a lot of hits recently, I would say. But anyway. Uh, themed it after the Civil War. So yes, it's a special McDonald's, a unique McDonald's. It's the only McDonald's I know of where you're sitting there, you know, eating your uh, your uh, Egg McMuffin, and there's like a picture of the Battle of the Wilderness on the wall. Yeah, and by the way, still, still very wild to this day. When I went to the, went to the wilderness, there were deer everywhere. Uh, that area is still very, very wild. Uh, oh, and one last fun fact about the Battle of the Wilderness. Um, this is the battle where we had to revise the losses for the Confederates significantly. The original number of losses given was 7,000. This was deliberately done by Lee. Lee told his officers not to report minor wounds. And that's because Lee wanted to definitively give the impression that his army was suffering few casualties in 1864 to affect morale in the North. That was a deliberate policy. The casualty figures since then have been revised. We now know Lee lost around 11,000 men at the wilderness. How many men did Not the North all. lose? Uh, a little over 17,000. Oh, okay. I, um, I didn't I, know it was that. I didn't know it was even that decisive. I thought it was just a bloody confrontation. Confederates did a little better, but Grant was confused by the fighting in the forest. I didn't know it was actually a relatively clear cut result yeah I, I, when people tell me the wilderness is like a union victory or a draw i'm like uh really i mean tactically it's not grant's attacks great grant's grant's attempt to beat lee is stop cold and lee counterattacks and crumples both flanks and like i said it's a lot of evidence the morale in the army of the potomac is pretty shaky after the wilderness all i'm trying to say is that grant made the best of a bad situation when the battle was over. You know, and to his credit, he didn't say like, oh, let's go fight out in the wilderness some more. He said, no, nah, let's get out of here. You know, so I just see, yeah, I see the wilderness as a Confederate victory that Grant made the best of considering his situation. I guess he realized he still had the numerical advantage even after his losses in the wilderness. Yeah, although that was going to fast end because Grant's other problem was enlistments were expiring. And so Grant lost 17,000 men here. He lost about 18,000 at Spotsylvania. And then 20,000 men just left because their enlistments were over. So in about three to four weeks, Grant lost half of his army. By the time you get to North Anna, the Army of the Potomac is like kind of small. And then they get major reinforcements. Um, that's something about Grant too. Like, guys like Burnside and Meade could say, "I need more men," and Halleck would go, "Ah, not really." When Grant said, I "Need more men," Halleck's like, "Sure thing. Here's some heavy artillery units." You know about the heavy artillery units? No. These things were fascinating. The these were units that were set to mostly defend Washington and other positions. They were trained as both infantry and artillery. Well, the wa defenses of Washington had something like. 
30 or 40,000 of these men and they, they form these massive units. I mean, you know, artillery, heavy artillery units could be like anywhere from 500 to like 2000 men. So to keep Grant's numbers up, they took these heavy artillery units and sent them south to act as infantry. Uh, what they were notorious for is that while they were well drilled, they were inexperienced. They tend to suffer horrendous losses. The most famous example is at Petersburg on June 18, 1864. The first main heavy artillery charges with 900 men. They lost over 615 minutes. And, you know, one of the reasons why they lost so heavily is that while the veterans behind them ducked and didn't really fully attack, they charged ahead because they don't know any better. You know, uh, I believe some of the men shouted to them, you know, you should duck. You can't take those forts. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like, like I said about Shiloh, too. Men who are inexperienced do have one advantage. They are impetuous. They will press an attack home. But in the case of the first main, it was a hopeless attack. And like I said, they suffered horrendous losses. And most of those heavy artillery units did. So, yeah, Grant does make up his losses, but it's with men who have never been in a fight before. And this is one of the reasons why Grant will not be able to take Petersburg or Richmond. By the time he reaches there, the army has lost most of its veterans. I mean, hell, by one casualty estimate, uh, the Second Corps of Grant's army had lost almost as many men as they'd started off with on the campaign. There's no way with those kind of casualties that you can sustain offensive operations. And you have multiple, I mean, God, like Petersburg. One thing that really struck me was that Petersburg the Union had like 13 brigade commanders who were killed or wounded. That is absolutely horrendous. So anyway, the wilderness is the beginning of the long and bloody overland campaign, which will see the Army of the Potomac essentially be destroyed uh, as an offensive fighting force. But Lee's army is just weak enough to where they can't fully take advantage of it, leading to the stalemate at Petersburg. Yeah. Anyway, you got any thoughts on the wilderness? Uh, it does sound like a pretty shitty battle to be in with people burning alive and uh, the confusion that comes from trying to fight in the woods. I haven't been to the wilderness proper, but I have been um, canoeing on the Rappahannock, which is on the northern part oh, okay. of the battlefield here. And the banks are pretty densely wooded from what I remember. So imagine hmm. if the terrain is fairly similar in terms of how wooded it is. That would be difficult to try to fight in a formation. I imagine a lot of guys probably got captured because they got lost or separated from their unit. Yes, that did happen quite a bit, definitely. Um, and also the, the woods were used by the Confederates in their right flank attack. Uh, that was done by General Gordon to uh, great effect. They were able to really take the Union by surprise there and crumple it. Uh, it's a good case he made if there had been an extra brigade there. It would have been a lot worse. Um, you want to move on to the uh, next battle right now? Yep. So number four is... That'd be Chancellorsville, not too far from the wilderness. So we move, we're moving, what, a mile to the east, maybe? Yeah, a few miles. Like four or five, maybe. Oh. If that. <laughs> uh, Chancellorsville itself is simply just a, a kind of like little small meeting, well, not a small, but like a meeting house, if you will. Uh, this battle is also noted as being the battle where Lee was probably his most outnumbered in some ways because Hooker's army was massive, 130,000 men. The Army of the Potomac was never this big under anybody else as it was under Hooker at Chancellorsville. Uh, Hooker's idea was that he would distract Lee at Fredericksburg and then march behind him. Now, what a lot of officers expected was that when Hooker marched behind Lee he would attack Lee. He didn't do that. He marched behind Lee and then fortified. This is Hooker's idea. Hooker's, Hooker believed that what he wanted to do was put Lee in a bad position, fortify and force Lee to attack him. And essentially he'd do to Lee, he would do to Lee what Lee had done to Burnside at Fredericksburg. So he um, wanted to sacrifice the major advantage of the Union Army, which was material, by going away from his supply lines and camping out in the woods and having Lee come into the woods after him? Yes. Yeah. Uh, remember, the idea is that Lee will be forced to attack him in entrenched positions. 
So Hooker, when he gets to Chancellorsville, just has his men fortify. Uh, really good case to be made that Hooker really botched that one. He had he had an advantage there. He'd outmarched Robert E. Lee. He'd outflanked him and taken him by surprise, but then he sacrifices that. Hooker had another problem, though, in some way, arguably a bigger problem. Um, Hooker had allied himself to the Radical Republicans. And while he did have allies in the army, a lot of the army's high command did not like him, such as General Slocum, Oliver Howard, George Meade wasn't too big on him either. Uh, Darius Coach really hated Hooker. And so Hooker just has a high command that's antagonistic towards him. Now, Hooker's men did fortify. Lee gets there and realizes, okay, the positions are too strong. Then Jeb Stewart came back and said, all right, Hooker's right flank is exposed. Howard had not fortified. So then Jacksoner takes his famous flank march, strikes Hooker in the afternoon, and uh, shatters Howard's 11th Corps. The next day, Lee launches a series of attacks. These attacks, by the way, are in many ways bloody failures. They're attacking fortified positions. Confederates suffer heavily. However, the Confederates had slightly higher ground. They massed artillery there and dominated the battlefield. This is one of the few battles in the Civil War where Confederate artillery was definitively superior. And by the way, while they're shelling the battlefield, one of the people they wound is General Hooker. He gets wounded. A cannonball blows up a column next to him, and this leaves him dazed and confused. There are some historians who think that if Hooker had not been wounded on that day, he would have been in full command of his senses and would have won the battle. But that this left him dazed and confused, and it didn't help that his own high command didn't like him. And so eventually Hooker falls back. And then Lee's the two halves of Lee's army meet, and this is considered was considered by a lot of the Confederates and Lee's army to be the true high point of um, Robert E. Lee. This, this fact that he had won this battle against a vastly, numerically vastly superior enemy, had attacked them and defeated them. Um, Chancellorsville was quite a shock in the North, because people were like, oh my God, Hooker had this monstrous horde of men, the biggest we've ever assembled, and he got beat. Now the battle... Lee accurately said, was bereft of strategic results. All they did was simply frustrate a Union offensive, which is cool and all, but you haven't really turned the tide or anything. But that said, Chancellorsville had a big effect on morale. Uh, I believe Lincoln said, my God, what will the country think? And Chancellorsville probably, I mean, if, if, if say the Confederates somehow had won Vicksburg or Gettysburg or something like that, Chancellorsville probably would have been seen as like the prologue to um, a successful Confederate summer instead of what it is. is like the last hurrah for Lee on the offensive, I guess you would say. A massive battle. Now, I will say one thing about the losses. That's controversial about it. Well, um, when people talk about the Battle of Chancellorsville, they mean in some ways two separate battles, the Battle of Chancellorsville and the Battle of Second Fredericksburg. I decide to keep them, and also the Battle of uh, Salem Church, I decide to keep all three of them together as one battle, okay? And the reason I did this is that it's a little hard to tell how diff how separate the losses were from one battle to the next. So Chancellorsville, in some ways, really is three battles all together, okay? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, this is true of a few other ones, too. Like, uh, usually the losses given for second bull run, when you look at them, are actually the um, the losses for the entire second bull run campaign. Uh, but for Chancellorsville, it's, from what I've at least seen, it's a little hard to tell um, which losses are different from one battle to the other. Anyway... Um, Although, wait, actually, I actually went to the Wikipedia page, and they actually have it laid out finally. Oh, that's cool. I guess you can separate them now. Oh. Oh, that's right. You can't for the Confederates. That's the problem. Anyway. Or it's harder for the Confederates. Anyway, sorry. Sorry for the weird digression there. That's the Battle of Chancellorsville. It is considered Lee's, along with Second Manassas, his two greatest victories. Definitely his victory against the tallest odds in many ways. Um, 
helped out by some good luck there. But of course, Stonewall Jackson suffered a mortal wound. Well, he got wounded, and I think he died of pneumonia or something. Am I right? I think it was something like that, because I know they amputated an arm, and while he was recovering, he got sick, either with pneumonia or maybe even an infection, and then died. I think it took three weeks or something, though. Okay. Um, and also, he did this battle with just Jackson, I guess, in the Hill, because uh, Longstreet was in Tennessee when this went down. Yes, that is correct. Longstreet was not in Tennessee. He was at Suffolk, Virginia. Oh, right. No, no, and mm. he went to yeah, he went to Tennessee after Gettysburg. Sorry, I mixed yes. that up. I knew it was an eight right. no. three, but Longstreet's away. He's at Suffolk, Virginia, with uh, Pickett and Hood's division. Yeah. What were they doing in Suffolk? Uh, they were they were there partially for forage. Um, the supply situation for Lee's army was very bad in early eighteen sixty three. So it was thought that if they were there, they could collect forage there and it would lessen the supply situation. It was also hoped they could take Suffolk, Virginia and have some success against Union coastal garrisons. Um, spoiler alert, they didn't. Uh, so anyway, you got any uh, thoughts on Chancellorsville? Not really. Um, pretty interesting battle, though. I remember we once played a board game about it and... Apparently, Jackson's flank march was a pretty big risk. Yes, definitely. Because I tried to do it, and I get very unlucky in board games, so Jackson waited forever to show up because of rain or whatever, and things did not go well for me in that game. Well, uh, do you want to move on to uh, battle number three? Sure. Let's go to the third bloodiest battle of the American Civil War. Although, you know what? I actually might have to revise this now that I think about it, because now that the Chancellorsville's, Chancellorsville losses are set aside, it might be more appropriate to break it up into three separate battles like I do for the seven days. So there you go, everybody. Sorry to say, uh, my fourth-ranked battle here may no longer be fourth-ranked on my list. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so... We're going to do Spotsylvania. You know much about Spotsylvania? Uh, was this was this the one with the angle, or is that an, was that uh, something else? Uh, there are a variety of angles. The two most famous angles are Spotsylvania and Gettysburg. So the angle at Gettysburg was the one where Pickett's division charged, and the angle was where Lou Armistead's brigade managed to break into the area. This angle is known as the Bloody Angle, which is when Grant pierced Lee's center and almost broke the army into two pieces. Well, you're really going to emphasize that word, almost, okay? Um, anyway, uh, Spotsylvania is the battle that follows up the wilderness. This is the one... Grant is going to march around Lee... Lee has kind of figured out that Grant's also going to be doing the same thing. Lee gets a slight jump on Grant. The only reason why, apparently, is that the soldiers who were going to be marching, it was there was fire everywhere, they could smell burning corpses, and they were kind of like, you know, let's just move on. So the Confederates managed to get to Spotsylvania first. Grant at first launches a series of uh, poorly coordinated attacks, mostly against Laurel Hill, which is a nearly impregnable position. However... During one attack, a general named Upton managed to rush the Confederate works and pierce the line for a bit. That's the important thing to keep in mind, too. You know, assault tactics for both sides in this war are very poorly developed. But Upton had figured out that if you could rush the enemy, you could have some success. So basically close the uh, distance as quickly as possible to avoid being gunned down in the open. Right. I mean, you got accounts where you got people who, when they would attack earthworks, they would stop to shoot at them. And you're like, what the hell are you doing stopping to shoot earthworks? Oh, that's right. You'd have been trained in true assault tactics. So anyway, Grant decides to attempt this on a grand scale. He's going to use the entire Second Corps to rush the enemy. This is where they're lucky, though. Lee, figuring that he wanted to attack Grant, pulled out the artillery in the area and was moving, having the artillery move out for a planned attack. 
So when Hancock attacks on May 12th, there's no artillery to shoot at them. They overwhelm the Confederate position. Lee reacts very quickly, throws out reserves he has. Um, God, there was one general, I forgot his name, but he was a Confederate general who, when he went to the charge, said, I will come out of this fight a living major general or a dead brigadier. Well, guess what he came out as? A dead brigadier. A dead brigadier. Yeah, I got to find his name, though, man. But anyway, well, so we're talking about absolutely was prescient. Yes, he was. Well, absolutely savage fighting. Uh, we're talking like veterans of countless other battles described this as the worst fight they'd ever been involved in. A rainstorm broke out, too. You know, just to make it even worse, right? Anyway, um, Lee's lines hold in the end. It's one of his finest one of his finest reactions as a commander. Some other attacks are made by Grant. Those fail as well. Grant tries to march around Lee's flank. There's a storm that breaks out. Lee does launch one counterattack, but it's pretty poorly conceived and turned back. Um, Spotsylvania is also famous for the Grant line about, I will fight it out all summer on this line if I have to. Which he does. And he, in the end, he marches around, and you know, that leads to the uh, North Anna the Battle of North Anna, if you will. Anyway, um, so this battle Spotsylvania... I always, I always mix this one up with Cold Harbor because in both cases the Confederates held a line, the Union assaulted it, were repulsed, and then the Confederates launched a counterattack that was pointless. Mm. They didn't. The Confederates didn't launch a counter a pointless counterattack at Cold Harbor. Did I thought they, they did uh, because obviously when they defended, it was a turkey shoot, kind of like Murray's Heights. And I think it was yeah. foggy. Lee orders a counterattack, and then that was the only part of the battle they actually lost men. So they were on the verge of having a perfect victory, and then they kind of fucked it up a little by launching the counterattack. Oh, oh, okay. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, you kind of make a case for that, I guess, you know? Huh. Thinking about that. Um... They did launch. They, that's right, Cold Harbor. They did. They did launch some counterattacks, but the thing is that those attacks weren't made with much verve, and they were. I mean, they weren't full blood affairs. And and Cold Harbor. Keep in mind, the losses of Cold Harbor very much favor the Confederates. I mean, we're talking like twelve thousand Union losses, five thousand Confederate. Um, Spotsylvania is but eighteen thousand Union, twelve thousand Confederate, roughly. All of the battles. That of the Overland campaign, this is the one where the Union does the best, and that's because they did pierce the lines. But in the end, it's still a defeat. The Union does not break Lee's back. Lee maintains. And that's something to keep in mind, too. Morale in the Potomac really starts falling off after Spotsylvania. The morale in Lee's army stays strong the entire time. Like, all the letters and diaries that we have indicate the morale was high. They're thinking to themselves... We're taking the best they have. They're throwing it at us and we're turning them back. So I rate Spotsylvania definitely a Confederate victory. However, once again, Grant loses the battle and goes, all right, well, I'll keep moving south. So once again, making the best of a bad situation. Yeah, I guess too, though, uh, knowing how the war ends, you can make the case for any battle the Confederates won. They won the battle, but it didn't really end up helping them that much in the end. And in this campaign especially, uh, this is all part of the same campaign where the Confederacy was destroyed. Yeah. Although, I, the Confederates probably won most of the battles in this campaign, didn't they? Uh, I would say so. Now, keeping in mind, uh, if you say that right now, with uh, the current Grant worship going on, they'll really jump your shit, man. I like, know. I've had, I, I mean, like, 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 the guy at the Emerging Civil War... You know, great guy, uh, but I thought it was hilarious. Like, we, we we exchange emails all the time on stuff, but the one time I mentioned that, yeah, you know, Lee won the Overland campaign, he had to have an argument with me via email about how I was wrong. Right? And I'm just like, wow, you guys are really passionate about... Um, about <laughs> you guys are really passionate about the Overland campaign's Union victory, aren't you? I'm like, it is not, because... Union morale, both in the army, but more importantly, back home, uh, falls. The price of gold shoots up. Lincoln's reelection hopes are uh, 
take a serious hit. So I don't know. I mean, like, I can't really see how this is a Union victory. Uh, Lee's army is intact. And not just that, the um, Lee's army is intact. And the, um, sorry, Lee's army is intact. And you haven't taken Richmond. I mean, if if they had somehow taken Richmond, I mean, Lee, cause Lee's army could have escaped. If you've taken Richmond, I mean, hell yeah, you've taken a factory center, the capital of the Confederacy. Uh, you've taken the, the city you've been obsessed with for so long. That's a big victory, wouldn't you say? I would say so. I mean, that would be a war-winning yeah, but- victory. Exactly. I mean, it'd be over, man. I mean, Lincoln's going to get reelected at that point, right? So, anyway, uh, but that doesn't happen. Mm. The uh, and the, the, the newspapers will talk about that too. They'll be like, the hopes that we had in May seem like they're dashed and lost. It's going to be Atlanta that's going to decide things ultimately, not what uh, Grant is up to at Petersburg. If anything, the fact that Grant has failed against Lee, failed to destroy his army, is going to be seen as something of an embarrassment. Anyway, you got any thoughts on Spotsylvania? Not especially. This is one that I don't know all that much about. Um, I guess when I was a teenager and I read about the Civil War, I tended to focus a lot more on the earlier battles for whatever reason, probably yeah. because what was available in the library and that my dad had in the basement. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think there was much on the Overland campaign that I had access to. Although, uh, it does seem like a pretty interesting battle, and I'm surprised that it's this high up, because I, I would not have guessed that Spotsylvania would be top five. I mean, I might have been able to guess top ten, but not top five. I kind of wish I'd made my guess. I, I, wish, I wish I'd had a guest list to see what I thought would have been the top 10, but I didn't think to do that. Could have been fun. <laughs> I would have gotten a lot of them wrong, but, you know, still. <laughs> what what were you expecting to see on here that you haven't seen? Um, I mean, there are a couple that... I, I mean, there's at least one that I know is going to be coming up. Um, there's... Uh, I knew Antietam would probably be on here somewhere. I thought it would be a little higher. Uh, Fredericksburg, I thought was going to be on here maybe, but... I guess that one I might have placed about correctly. Shiloh, I thought would be a lot higher. Um, does Petersburg, the siege count? Or would that even have the No, those are a bunch of separate battles. Okay. Although I do want to say real quick, I, I really quick with Wikipedia did the math on it, and Chancellorsville itself is still in the top ten bloodiest battles of the Civil War. It's just that it's number eight. Okay. Instead of number four. All right, so... Take out... Salem Church and Second Fredericksburg, which seems appropriate to me. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else would I have guessed would go on here? Maybe some of the battles near Atlanta. Yeah, those actually were not... Actually, nothing in the Atlanta campaign really compared to stuff in Virginia. And interestingly enough, uh, Sherman mentioned that because after Kennesaw Mountain, the guys were like, oh my God, we lost a lot of men. They lost 3,000 men. And Sherman actually said, like, oh, I've seen the casualty figures in Virginia. That was nothing. Um, Yeah, think about that. Kennesaw Mountain, right? I mean, fairly well-known Atlanta battle. Combined losses, less than 5,000. Now, don't get me wrong, man. This is still fucking war. It's still horrible. The regiments at Kennesaw Mountain that really charged home took horrendous casualties. A variety of Union Brigade commanders were killed. The bloodiest battle of the Atlanta campaign is what's usually called the Battle of Atlanta or East Atlanta, and that had a combined casualty number of 12,000. So yeah, the Atlanta campaign, and honestly, dude, that's one of the reasons why Sherman takes Atlanta. When his men get there, they have not been blown to pieces. They are not exhausted. Well, they're tired, but they're not, like, exhausted, and... They don't feel like their commander has thrown their lives away because I got to tell you, you read letters in Grant's army, absolutely appalled the casualties they've suffered. The morale of the Army of the Potomac is low. All right. So, you know, you, Atlanta, when Sherman gets there, his army, sure, they fought some battles, but they're not, they're, their morale is still good. The units have taken casualties, but they haven't taken horrendous losses because the army is still intact. They can maneuver, and because they can maneuver, they will eventually kick Hood out of Atlanta. 
But if Sherman had decided to reenact the Battle of the Wilderness in northern Georgia, I don't think he takes Atlanta. I think he fails. Because he could have hurtled his men at Johnston's fortifications and been absolutely slaughtered in numerous battles. And he was. Like, the times when the Union did test Johnston's fortifications, like Pickett's Mill and Kennesaw Mountain, those are horrendous battles for the Union, for the, for the forces involved. I mean, Pickett's Mill is a relatively small fight. The men involved got butchered. You know? Yeah, and I guess uh, Franklin was pretty bloody, but probably a little too small scale to crack the top ten. Yeah, it's in the top twenty, if I'm not mistaken. Let me uh, let me check real quick. Uh, yeah, Franklin's in the top twenty. Yeah, I visited that one last year, and I saw the one barn that shot up. Uh, oh yeah, that's, a lot that's of lead the, being hurled in that nice. battle. Uh, what'd you say, man? There was a lot of lead in the air that day because if you look at the surviving buildings, they're riddled with bullets. You just now sounded like a Civil War letter. Like, there was a lot of lead in the air that day. That's a, that's some shit I run into in my research. <laughs> well, you know, I was channeling my uh, past life where I fought at the Battle of Franklin, so. <laughs> because I did and some reminds- DMT based spirit archaeology with Graham Hancock recently, and I learned about some of my past experiences. Oh, did you also do a DMT with Joe Rogan and Graham Hancock? Is that it? I mean, Joe couldn't make it that day. He was busy, and he had moved to Texas and whatnot, so he wasn't able to make it. But uh, I did get to meet with Graham, and he also said that he was deeply offended by my video, but that he was glad to have somebody to do DMT with, so he was willing to overlook it. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Oh, I did want to mention, there was one, um, there was one thing that, uh, yeah, there was some... Um, Oh yeah, that you're talking about like your past life, right? So sure. were you? So your past life, you're a Civil War soldier. Uh, you ever saw the movie Near Dark, vampire movie? No, I have not. Ah, it's got this great line. It's my favorite lines ever in a horror movie. So the this kid's been turned to a vampire. He's talking to Lance Henriksen, you know, of Aliens fame, and he's like, "How old are you?" And he goes, "Well, I fought for the South. We lost." <laughs> I fought for the South. We lost. That's his line. <laughs> That's an accurate so, summation of the war, though. I mean, <laughs> you could say the same, man. You'd be like, ah, the past lives at Franklin. Somebody's like, what happened? It's like, I fought for the South. We lost. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, man. An admirably so that's possible. That's Spotsylvania for you. This is where you're starting to get uh, something that's closer to trench warfare in many ways. Uh, by the time you get to Spotsylvania, both armies are getting have gotten really good at fortifying. However, the second bloodiest battle of the war is our next one. And they uh, did not really fortify much of this one. That is Chickamauga. Did you expect Chickamauga to be in the top oh, ten? Oh, fuck. Okay, I didn't think of Chickamauga, but uh, if I had actually thought to write out a list this would have made it although i probably would have put this one around five yeah wow no it's the uh second uh, second bloodiest battle of the war in fact uh it's casualty estimates have gone up went up in the last uh 20 or 30 years they thought the losses were a little lower before but no we know we know now the rebels lost about eighteen thousand, and the union sixteen thousand. <laughs> so what happened is, is that uh, Rosecrans outmaneuvered Bragg and took Chattanooga. He then invades northern Georgia. His forces are dispersed because Rosecrans liked dispersed forces. Bragg tried to pounce on some of those groups, but that failed because Bragg's generals second-guessed his orders. Bragg ends up fighting uh, Rosecrans at Chickamauga. This is a massive, confused battle. Lots of assaults. Ultimately, what's decisive is that Rosecrans ordered General Wood's division to shift over. It was a mistake. Wood, instead of saying that's a mistake, shifted over, creating a hole. That hole was created exactly the moment when Longstreet was launching an assault. So you got about, what, ten to 15,000 screaming Confederates just going through a hole in your lines. So was you, Hood under Longstreet in this battle? or He was, but he'd been wounded by that time. Okay, because I see Hood listed on no, the battlefield, was... but I don't see Longstreet uh, listed. No, he was wounded. No, he was wounded during the attack on, into the hole, if you will. 
Uh, the Union Army is shattered. Rosecrans fell back with the army to rally at a Chattanooga. Uh, this was actually a smart move by Rosecrans. I mean, he was a charismatic, popular officer. His idea is, I'll rally the men. He told Thomas, just buy me time, which is what Thomas does. He makes a stand at Songgrass Hill, um, holds out, and turns back a series of Confederate attacks before he too retreats. Chickamauga is a Union victory, but this is definitely a Pyrrhic Confederate victory. The Confederates suffered horrendous casualties and right afterwards immediately started bickering. And whatever results that could have gotten from Chickamauga were squandered by Bragg and his generals afterwards. Although one thing, because the, the Army of Tennessee had fought in many battles and come close to winning, but it never won, when they did win at Chickamauga... The, it was reported that there was a massive, like once the Union had withdrawn from the battlefield, despite all the horrendous casualties, there was a massive yell that was heard from miles around. And it was, it was just Confederate soldiers yelling and screaming because they had finally beaten them in the Western Theater. They finally won a battle. Chickamauga fascinates me in one regard in particular. It sort of proves Lee's argument right. Because what you had in the Confederacy was you had Lee who concentrated in Virginia, and then it was what was what's been called in the Great Book how the South, how the North won. They have something called what they call the Western Concentration Block, which is headed up by Beauregard. And this is the idea that what the Confederacy to do is not focus on Virginia, but put resources resources into the Western theater, launch an offensive, and turn the tide there. Lee was always against this, partially because he's in Virginia, he wants more men for his theater. But Lee would actually say, I don't know what you can gain in the West. He would always insinuate the generals there were not altogether that competent. And also, it should be noted, whenever the Union took a city and heavily fortified it, the Confederates never took it back. Ever. You know? Like Corinth, Nashville, Chattanooga, Memphis... I mean, they might skirmish along the edges or raid, but the Confederates just don't have the capacity to capture heavily fortified cities. They don't have the manpower and the resources. So I would say in some ways Chickamauga shows that maybe Lee is a better strategist than he's given credit for. Because, yeah, sure, they win a battle. They don't gain much from it. I mean, they're able to kind of bottle up the Army of the Cumberland and Chattanooga for a little bit, but eventually the supply lines opened up, and then the Union wins the Battle of Chattanooga. You know, so Chickamauga is a Confederate victory, but it's also considered a hollow victory. Although at the time it did cause quite a panic in the North because you know, Chickamauga comes after a, a season of victories, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, Port Hudson, and Tullahoma. And suddenly you have a defeat, a defeat that could maybe lead to an army surrendering, which is one of the reasons why Rosecrans got removed, of course. Anyway, yeah. you got any thoughts on Chickamauga? It is one of the more interesting battles, and I think it does show how unfortunate and ill-fated the Army of Tennessee was because their one victory is one where they not only had to have a significant number of soldiers from Virginia arrive, but also they lost more men than the Union and had no follow-up at all. So uh, I think yeah. that that in itself is one of the more damning indictments for the Army of Tennessee, the fact that their great moment is this. Yeah, they had a few separate moments, too, and especially the, the cavalry under Forrest and Morgan had a lot of great moments. But yeah, their one big battlefield victory, it doesn't amount to much, does it? No. And um, interesting side note, so my dad, because of going to staff colleges when he was in the Army, had a passing knowledge of the Civil War. And for whatever reason, he remembers things incorrectly. I guess the spellings just alter in his mind over time. Yeah. And we went to a Mexican restaurant and he saw something on the menu and said, oh, I know what that must be named after. He's talking about a chimichanga. So yeah. then he uh, closed the menu and when the waiter came up, he said, yes, sir, I will take a chickamonga. And then we looked at him, what the hell's a chickamonga? And he said, um... You know this, and then he's like, "Oh well, this, this, you say that chickamonga, right? No, that's chimichanga. Okay." And then my mom, after the waiter gone away, she, Brian, what the hell were you talking about? He said, "Oh, there's a civil war battle, chickamonga." 
And then I was thinking oh, back, because I just read about it. No, that's Chickamauga. It's not even spelled <laughs> anywhere near manga with an O. So, uh, yeah, that's my Chickamauga story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, I guess that uh, after the battle, wasn't Jefferson Davis still interested in relieving Bragg for somebody else? And he offered it to Longstreet and a bunch of other people, and none of them would take it. I don't know about that part in particular. I know that Davis tried to remove Bragg after Stones River. Uh, but the problem was a guy like Har Hardy was always dodging it. Like Davis offered to Hardy several times and Hardy turned him down. That's why actually one of the reasons why when Davis relieved Joseph e. Joseph E. Johnston Atlanta, he replaced him with Hood and not Hardy, because by that time he was kinda like Hardy, I'm tired of your shit. I'm not making command of the army. Anyway. Um, I think that the Davis's mindset about Chickamauga was how can I remove a Confederate general after you won a battle? Right? Like, doesn't it seem kind of ridiculous? Yeah. You know? Yeah, so he just, he didn't really do that one. I do know after Stones River, his main idea with Bragg was he wanted Joseph e. Johnston to replace him. Now, Johnston was a theater commander, and Johnston had the power to remove anybody within the Western theater. And Davis was like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, remove Bragg. <laughs> but Johnston goes there, and Johnston felt on the one hand, he's like, that's dishonorable for me just to remove Bragg. But at the same time, he was very impressed with the discipline of the Army of Tennessee. And also, Bragg had a superpower. Bragg was always able to make superiors happy because he was very obedient. Literally, almost every one of Bragg's superiors talked him up constantly whether that's the Mexican War or the Civil War. So I think that Johnston shows up to hang out with Bragg, and he's just like, oh, this guy Bragg's great. So Bragg remained in command of the Army of Tennessee for that reason. Um, I don't know about that. I, I'd have to read more about what happened with the Army post-Tennessee. I mean, I know some things like, like Polk was removed, so was Hill and Hindman. Those three were removed because those three were considered to be the most – cantankerous of the anti-brag click and, and of course the other street went... oh go ahead i was saying mm -hmm. the other core was... commanders though i mean uh, stewart was fairly young and inexperienced cheatham was a drunk yeah they're they're commanding divisions cheatham's not that big on brag stewart actually is pro brag uh yeah stewart's one of the pro brag guys uh yeah just there's i mean they what he did was he sent away Hill and Polk, and of course Longstreet was sent off to try to take Knoxville, which didn't work out. Um, the Knoxville campaign, people like hold it against. They like, oh well, they removed troops away from the vital point, and I'm like, that's kind of true. But the Confederates, by the time Longstreet goes to Knoxville, the Confederates know that they're not going to retake Chattanooga, you know. So they're like, all right, this isn't going to happen. So I think what they were like is like, well, where, where can we hit him? I uh, hit him in Knoxville. So I think that was kind of the thinking there was they're trying to be offensive minded still. Uh, but anyway, so that's the Battle of Chickamauga. A very confusing mess of a battle. Massive. Lots of assaults. Um, rugged terrain. Tough one to follow in many. Yeah, rugged terrain. I, I have the book Maps of Chickamauga, which I got for a discount. The book's like, the book's like $80, man. Uh, but it, it gives you the battle piece by piece, step by step. Excellent book, but God, I mean, that's a bear of a battle, man. I mean, God, there's the fucking... Oh, yeah, Dave Powell. Uh, Dave Powell wrote Maps of Chickamauga. He just finished, I feel, a few years ago, he finished <coughs> a trilogy on Chickamauga. A three-volume set on this battle. And that's how big this one is. Damn. Yeah, I know, man. It also looks um, like these guys just, are pretty spread out compared to a lot of the other battles we've looked at. Yes, it happens over a massive piece of ground. By the way, fun fact, the Chickamauga Battlefield is the first National Park battlefield set up. Which, when you were talking about Shiloh having a lot of cannons, Chickamauga's got a fuckload of cannons too. But that's because when you go to those national parks, the cannons you're seeing are authentic. Not the carriages they're on, but the actual cannon tubes themselves. And so Chickamauga and Shiloh, being two of the original five, just have a lot of cannons because there was a lot lying around. 
Yeah, but isn't that kind of crazy? You go to a Civil War battlefield and the cannons you see are actually like from the period. Isn't that crazy? It's pretty cool. Uh, I did mm-hmm. like that about Shiloh, having all the cannons lined up. The other, the other one I visited where there's a lot of stuff there is Petersburg. Although that one is more about the fortifications than the cannons. Because they've kept yeah, the fortifications so. intact and it looks pretty good in terms of figuring out where the siege lines were. Although, I mean, yeah. just like all the other fields, a lot of the towns nearby have grown, so you don't have the full line around Petersburg. But there's still a pretty significant chunk of it preserved, and you can get a pretty good idea of what it's like. Okay. But yeah, you actually haven't been there, have you? No, you've written the book on it. Well, I was actually telling the people at the uh, Civil War Museum in New Orleans about that. It was like, I've been to all these battlefields. I've tried to go to Petersburg three times. It's always failed. <laughs> Something always gets in the way. The battlefield I mean, is pretty I've... cool. Uh, although Petersburg itself as a town is kind of crappy. Or That's at least what it was everyone... when I was there. Dude, everyone tells me that, man. Like, everybody. They're like, uh, don't worry about the town. I'm like, is it really that bad? Okay, I'll say this for it. It's not as tiny as Savannah, Tennessee, so you will be able to find more than two restaurants. I mean, it's a you know fairly large town, even small city, so it's got that going for it. But it is fairly run down and just not altogether nice. Okay, just I mean, literally, it's what everybody always tells me, you know. But I'm also like, I don't know. Grew up in New Orleans. We got some really run down sections of town here, right? Yeah, I mean, so... it's, I mean, when I say it's bad, I mean it's not it's not a third world country or whatever. It's just kind of blah. So, I mean, I don't want to put too fine of a point on it. I mean, it's not like if you go there, you'll die. But uh, it's just kind of, it's just not a very pleasant city to look at. Yeah. You want to take a quick break, um, do whatever Super Chats we have, and then do the uh, bloodiest battle of Civil War, which we all know what it is at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, it's clearly the Battle of Perryville. So, before we get to Perryville, (laughs) we will... uh, Get the last super chats here that have come in. So, hey man, hey man. Perryville, Perryville is in the top twenty-five, so you know oh. don't be too bad, to Perryville. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, I know that because of the reenactment we saw it was basically all uh, Confederate cavalry versus Union infantry. So, all right. Uh, <laughs> Michael Klein asked, "What would happen if Lincoln was not reelected?" Wait, let's take a break first, and we'll get to the question. Okay. Okay. I think right. I will also take a fiver, so everybody hang tight, and then we'll get to the question about Lincoln's re-election. Yes, and thank you, Michael Klein. We'll get right to your question in a sec. Oof. Oof. 
Well, I'm back. Um, I can answer the question. What would happen if Lincoln was not reelected from Michael Klein? Thank you again uh, for the super chat. Uh, a bit, a bit hard to say. A few things should be kept in mind. Uh, George McClellan was not a peace Democrat. This is the worst part of Ken Burns' civil war. He's like, he's like uh, McClellan was on a peace platform. He was not. In fact, McClellan is notorious for being the first major presidential candidate to reject his party's own platform because McClellan was definitely a man for the Union. So would the war have continued? Yes, definitely. However, Lincoln probably said it best. If McClellan was going to win, it could only be a faith in a Union victory had collapsed. Now, a few things McClellan would have done. He would have, I mean, if he was going to be a man of his principles, that is, he would have released various political prisoners. He would not have persecuted uh, various newspapers. Remember, you know, Lincoln and his people shut down a variety of American newspapers for not being pro-North enough, if you will. Um, one sticky situation for McClellan would have been emancipation. He was against it, but I don't really see him being able to take literal Union soldiers, like black soldiers in the USCT, and kicking them out of the army. Um, I It's hard to really see McClellan being able to turn the clock back on that one. Uh, he may, however, he definitely, however, would have offered the South favorable peace terms. Um, when I thought about this, because I will eventually design a st strategic civil war game, my idea with McClellan winning, if he does, the war goes on. The North's will to win decreases every turn because obviously if he's won, it means faith in the war has de declined significantly. And also McClellan's own political incompetence would probably undermine him as it went on. But could McClellan have become president and won the war? Yeah, certainly. Definitely. I mean, that could have happened for sure. In fact, if anything, it might have. I mean, 1865, the Confederacy's pretty much collapsing. So yeah, McClellan could have won the war. Um, God, that'd have been that'd be a terrible presidency. <laughs> I can't see McClellan surviving in that kind of environment. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I went and answered the. I went ahead and answered the. Uh, what would happen if uh, Lincoln was not reelected? Question. Uh, and Ken Cook, Biden was. What does it say? In his past life, I guess this one is more for me. Um, What's that, man? The only problem is that Biden being Prepolaeus would necessitate that Obama be Cassander. And Obama is not on the Cassander level. Although, to be fair, Obama probably had more charisma than Cassander. But aside from that, Cassander would beat him out in every other category. That being said, what yeah, Biden, Biden, Biden is very much a second banana. Uh, Cassander was a Macedonian king during the successor era. He was Antipater's son. And he was oh, a really, yes, yes, yeah. really capable yeah. leader. Prepolaeus was his chief general for most of that period, aside from Cassander's own brothers. And Prepolaeus' only real talent was staying loyal and showing up. But every time he did show up, he usually got beat. But at least he kept showing up, and he never betrayed Cassander. And in that era, if you didn't betray your leader, then that's something. So, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's a skill. I mean, I don't know about skill, but it's a it's a trait that's positive. So there you go. Uh, uh, a virtue, maybe. Yeah, it's a virtue. There we go. Biden as Prepolaeus, I guess to a certain extent. I mean, I don't think he has in any way deviated from the Obama legacy or whatever you want to call it. Nor do I think he would if elected. So yeah, I guess that's fair, in a way. I don't disagree. I just wanted to make sure that we understand that. While Biden and Prepolaeus might be on the same level, that does not mean that Cassander and Obama are equal. <laughs> I got you, man. Um, yeah, though, I guess as a quick aside, uh, I, I listened to your video about the, uh, the last debate, Biden-Trump. Um, you know, I did, my perspective is it seemed that was more of a Trump victory, but not by much. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically what I've felt. I mean, on the substance, uh, I mean, Biden probably won the debate, but I don't know how many people look for substance in debates. 
So I was trying to imagine what people who were still on the fence were looking for. Uh, they don't. They don't look for substance. Uh, but it, it also, I mean, I don't know, man. There's there's a lot more apathy for this election out there than people want to admit. You know? I don't know if it's uh, a sign of engagement or apathy. I don't know about you but or all of you out there, but I've been getting barraged with text messages and phone calls from various organizations making sure that I've uh, submitted my absentee ballot and all that shit. Yes. And, uh, uh, I'm always being called Tatiana. They're always like, hi, Tatiana. And I'm <laughs> always like, oh, <laughs> So is this the time to reveal that you had a uh, gender swap about a decade ago? No, no. I've been the, the, um, the critical drinker. I've been hanging out with his Tatiana. Anyway, YouTube jokes. Um, no, I don't know, man. Whatever. It's just, I don't, I don't think the enthusiasm is quite there. I don't know. Ice Cube is talking about that recently where he's like, all right, so plans to beat Trump. What happens after that? You know, which we could go on forever. But anyway, yeah. uh, Danny still thinks that uh, Trump's going to win. I still got Biden to win. We'll see how it turns out. Yeah, I made my it's official be- prediction a couple weeks ago on my other channel in terms of what the map will look like. So we'll see yeah, if it's that holds up at all. Our next super chat from Ken Cook is, have either of you been to the Vicksburg Military Park? Cheers, guys, with some champagne bottles. Thank you very much, Ken, and cheers to you as well. Oh, okay. There's also one from Levant right before that. We'll do Ken's first since we already have it. Okay. Sorry for passing up Levant. No, it's fine. I mean, it just happens. These uh, things are a little hard to keep up with sometimes. But uh, go ahead. I've never been to Vicksburg. Uh, it's actually the first. Uh, it's it's actually the first national battlefield I ever went to. Uh, God, that was a long time ago. They were still setting up the uh, the USS Cairo, was still being uh, built up, being uh, renovated at the time and set up. I'd love to go back to see that. Um, what's interesting about the Vicksburg battlefield? I mean, it's very good. You you can see the siege lines, see the terrain. You also, it, it, it's like the. It gave me a false impression because there's a relatively speaking an equal number of Union and Confederate monuments there, which when you go to most battlefields is not the case. I mean, a lot of Union stuff because they had more money. You know, the, you know, the South was very poor after the war. They couldn't afford to just put monuments up everywhere. I remember one guy I was talking to, uh, Ross Massey, who wrote the uh, Nashville Battlefield Guide. He told me that one of like his mother said that his like grandfather or great grandfather when he went to Shiloh was depressed when he saw all the Union monuments there, you know, monuments to Union victory on Southern soil kind of idea. So Vicksburg is very unusual in that it's equal on both sides. It seems that almost every Confederate general who was at Vicksburg gets a monument. And the thing about the Vicksburg battle, Vicksburg battles is that the confederate generals there are typically like the like the b team I mean, i'm not saying they were all bad i'm just saying that a lot of the ones who are more famous and celebrated they're not at vicksburg so it's kind of funny when you're on the battlefield you're like oh great a monument to this guy yeah <laughs> like some minor yeah. general if you will <laughs> it's just it's kind of weird in that regard but no vicksburg's um Vicksburg's a good one to go to. I'm 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 hoping to uh to visit again sometime soon. All right. Um it sounds like a pretty interesting one. I, that's probably one I'll hopefully get to at some point. Levant asked, "You guys watched the 1947 interview with Corporal Julius General Howell? Have you seen that, Sean? I watched it fairly recently." No, what is it? So it's an interview from the 40s with a Civil War survivor. He was a Confederate. I believe he was a teenager at the time the war was fought. And Mm -hmm. I don't remember his exact story, but it was... I think he's one of the last living survivors of the war. He was over 100, and he got visited by Helen Longstreet and some of the other bigwigs of the South who were still around at the time. And anyway, he was a very cogent old guy, and um, it was funny because a lot of the comments of the video were just like, people spoke so well back then, everybody was so um, eloquent, unlike today, where there's all these ums and uh, likes and all this other shit that we don't like. But anyway, um, he, he 
famously said that the war was not about slavery and that's not why any of them fought. But he also admitted that his family had not really owned slaves because their business didn't really call for it or something along those lines. And he's also from a part of the state where there weren't that many slaves to begin with. So, I mean, he was maybe speaking about his own little experience, but a lot of people have taken that out of context to prove that the Confederates were not inspired by slavery. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he is very well-spoken for a guy that old. He was very with it. But um, to be fair, I mean, he, he'd had 80 years to rehearse what he was going to say, approximately, by the time <laughs> this took place. So this was a story he had told a few times by the time that he told it to whoever interviewed him in 1947. Yeah. Well, before I continue, I have to say, um, like, just saying, right? Are you like, uh, um, sure, Sean? And uh, um um yeah um uh, war was was uh, uh the slavery was uh, one of the most important issues of the war um you know like um uh, like how um like how borders were one of the most important issues of the Mexican war you know what i mean absolutely man i mean i know what you mean if you know what i mean yeah cool we should use more cliched terms uh, I don't know. I'll I'll I'll, I'll listen to that. Thank you for uh, thank you for mentioning it, uh, Levant. Um, yeah, I definitely want to check that out, man. Um, that sounds good. Um, like, yeah. <laughs> but no, that 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 that, 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 bitch, that bitch you listen to, and I don't know the the slavery thing is in that regard is unusual. I think it's it's harder. It's it's not the best explanation for Confederate soldier motivation, uh, but it definitely is what's motivating Confederate elites, right? So that's kind of my take on that one, at least. You know, not that every I mean, anyway, not that Confederate soldiers weren't motivated by that, but only that really they talk about home defense way more than they talk about slavery. Kind of like how Union soldiers talk about the Union more than they do slavery in their letters for motivation. So, but that said, you know, when it comes to your Southern elites, then it's they're they're a bunch of slaveholding faux aristocrats. So of course they're obsessed with trying to maintain the system because that system is their power. Of course. Mm. But anyway, do you want to get to the bloodiest battle of the Civil War? Yeah, so let's talk about Camp Wildcat. Oh, fuck. God. Now you got obscure, man. Camp Wildcat. The only reason I know it Holy exists shit. is because I drive past the marker for it, or at least one of the signs to visit it. And then I happened to ask you about it one time, and you told me that it was a battle between a couple dozen guys. Yeah, not much happened there. I, I, I yeah, love the name, though. Camp Wildcat. Sounds like a cool place, right? Yeah, because I assumed it was a major base during the Civil War and something had actually happened there. And then you told me, no, that was just literally a skirmish. They fired a volley and then the other side left. That was the battle. Well, well shit. Yeah, this thing, it'll be like, the battle of this was fought here. And I'm like, wait, wait, eight guys died. That's not a battle, bro. That's a skirmish. In my mom's hometown, I, there's a big monument in the middle of the city commemorating a battle. I looked into it. The so-called battle is that the Union cavalry rode in, exchanged some shots with maybe a militia or some sort of home guard, and we're talking about a couple dozen men on each side. The home guard scattered and fled, and that was the battle. I don't even know if anybody got killed. What's your mom's hometown? Salisbury, North Carolina. Oh, yeah, that that would be at the end of the war. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think that's Sherman coming north, and it, so it'd probably be Stoneman. And also, there are a lot of placards for Stoneman throughout that area. Yeah, because Stoneman's cavalry was coming through, like uh, like they talk about in the uh, famous song, "the the night they drove old Dixie down." But anyway, so here we are, sir, at the Battle of Gettysburg, right? Right. The most, the least known battle of all time, right? Yes. You hear about that Soviet delegation? I think it was James McPherson talked about this. There was a delegation of of Soviets who had come to America, and they were they wanted to bring them to like Bunker Hill or Saratoga, and they said, "No, bring us to Gettysburg." And they and they said, "It's the American Stalingrad." That's what they called it. Uh, no. 
<laughs> I mean, clearly Stalingrad was way, way, way fucking worse. I don't think those are two comparable battles at all. Although, keep something in mind, too. It's a three-day battle, and casualties are in excess of 45,000. That's pretty rough. Like, in World War II, three days and 45,000 casualties, and 45,000 casualties in three days in World War II would be considered pretty fucking intense. I mean, that's basically, uh, what was the operation where the Russians crushed Army Group Center? That's probably the casualty rates from that, about. Oh, yeah, Bagration. Yeah, Bagration. That could be, yeah. That's the thing they say about the about these uh, civil war battles is that of course you know civil war and Napoleonic battles are, n I mean the losses don't compare to World War One and World War Two, but keeping in mind the battles of World War One and World War Two, I mean fuck the Battle of Verdun lasts a year, you know. Yeah. Um, also, uh, uh, there was a question I saw earlier in the chat that we didn't respond to, but I guess it's sort of relevant from what we're, what we're talking about now. Um, somebody asked, couldn't you argue that Lee's, um, all his victories were Pyrrhic in a way, if you look at the relative losses, but I mean, in musket combat, losses were never super lopsided like they are in ancient or modern battles. Yes, very true. Um, especially since neither side really has good pursuit, uh, cavalry, at least the North doesn't until the end of the war with, uh, Sheridan and Virginia. Uh, so yeah, the losses are pretty much uh, even the winner, like a battle like Stones River or Shiloh, right? Like, okay, the, the the Union wins both those, but they're not really in a position to exploit their victory afterwards. The losses are just too heavy. Uh, so I would say that um, Lee's victories are not Pyrrhic because. Lee is trying to affect Northern morale and change the strategic situation in Virginia, which he is able to do with seven days, second Manassas. Um, yeah, seven days and second Manassas. He's def definitely able to change st the strategic um, uh, situation. And Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville have a very big effect on Northern morale. And let's say theoretically Lee does win at Antietam or Gettysburg. That would be a big effect on morale. So I would not view Lee's victories as Pyrrhic within their given situation. You know, um, we could say that Lee suffered these very heavy losses and that he threw the lives of his men away, maybe. And that's an argument we'll make is that Lee was too pugnacious. He was too willing to attack. And therefore, the losses really ate away at, at uh, Confederate manpower. Uh it's a decent enough case, but Lee's argument would have been, we never had the, the manpower advantage. We need dramatic victories to gain as fast of a peace settlement as we possibly can. And I believe that Lee's overall strategic calculation on that regard was correct. They could not wear down the North. They had to try to win a dramatic victories. They had to try to win a series of dramatic victories to hurt Northern morale enough to where the Lincoln administration would um, collapse, if you will, which was possible. The Lincoln's Lincoln was a thoroughly despised man. The North, in many cases, um, it's kind of funny. Like we think of him as like this revered war leader, but when you read stuff at the time, he's mocked and insulted all the time by people in his own party. So I don't know. I'm just saying. I think Lee's strategic calculation uh, was sound. But it ultimately didn't work out. But it was sound. I don't think they could have wore the North down. They could have fought a guerrilla war, but that would have been... Uh, whew, God. That, that, would have, that would have involved an upending of Southern society they weren't prepared for. And keeping in mind that, too, we can argue if the Confederacy was a revolution. I wouldn't say that it's a revolution. But regardless, if you do think it's a revolution, it's most certainly a conservative revolution. And guerrilla warfare has a tendency to really shred the social fabric, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. So guys like Lee are not going to fight guerrilla warfare. Like, they'll, they'll surrender before that happens. Hell, that's what Lee did. He surrendered instead of fighting a guerrilla war. He could have done it, but he said, no, let's give up. So, yes, quite literally, he surrendered before fighting a guerrilla war. Mr. Chick, I am a gentleman. I do not engage in such dishonorable practices as this so-called guerrilla warfare. 
<laughs> we would not be involved in partisan fighting. I, mean, I guess for, and also for them, if they thought about partisan fighting, it would be the war in Spain, which they would look at that and go like, we are not reenacting the Peninsular War, right? Yeah, they're not doing that. But anyway, Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so Lee invades North for the second time. His idea is that invading the North will relieve pressure on the West. That is a very questionable strategic judgment. Other, Lee's other idea was to seize supplies, hurt Northern morale, and hopefully fight and win a battle on Northern soil that would damage their morale. Uh, Lee's initial maneuvers are successful. Eventually, though, he's drawn into the Battle of Gettysburg. A hooker was removed because Halleck hated him. Meade was put in command. Uh, battles fought over three days. Some people say July 1st was a Confederate victory. I would say it wasn't. The Confederates suffered very heavy losses on July 1st. A lot of poor coordination. And they did not take the hills south of town. Meade sets his men up on those hills. Which Fun fact about that, too. I think it was General Hancock said that even somebody completely unlettered in the science of, of, of warfare would have known the hills south of Gettysburg were a great defensive position. Lee foregoes Longstreet's advice, which is move around Meade. Instead, uh, Lee attacks Meade on both of his flanks. Those flanks are severely tested. In fact, the left flank does come fairly close to breaking, but the flanks hold. Lee, thinking the Union strength is on the flanks, then decides to attack the center, to pierce the center. Uh, that, of course, is Pickett's Charge, famed attack across open ground. The Confederate assault columns are shredded. Uh, this attack, by the way, the, 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 the assault on the center doesn't just involve Pickett, it involves two other divisions. But those divisions were already chewed up. That was like Heath's division and Pender's division. And they weren't even led by Heath and Pender. Pender suffered a mortal wound. Heath was already wounded. So they have new uh, division commanders, Pettigrew and Trimble. And those men were already chewed up. So Lee is taking two chewed up divisions and one division of fresh, but I don't want to say inexperienced, but Pickett's men had not been involved in a major scrap since Antietam. And some of them even, you know, later than that. So these are not, I mean, they're veterans, but they're not like, you know, battle tested vet battle battle they're not the elite of the army all right those divisions are shredded in the attack uh that said lee is able to retreat the morale of the army is still very high and lee is able to um save his army by getting across the potomac now could Meade have actually pursued lee and destroyed his army i would say probably not doesn't have pursuit cavalry for one thing also when Meade does finally confront lee at falling waters Lee had a very strong defensive position. Uh, most of the stuff I've read indicates the Confederates were sad Meade didn't attack. They were hoping he would attack and that they would inflict heavy losses on him and get some revenge for Gettysburg. That's something to keep in mind, too. Meade's army, I mean, Meade was victorious at Gettysburg, of course, but he had suffered really heavy losses. I mean, honestly... Um, no Union army in the Civil War suffered as many losses as Meade did at Gettysburg. The only person who suffered more out of any army north or south was Lee at Gettysburg. And Meade had seven corps at Gettysburg. Of his seven corps commanders, three are wounded. Dan Sickles, Hancock, I'm sorry, Dan Sickles and Hancock are wounded, and Reynolds is dead. I got to tell you, man, corps commanders, because of the nature of their job, you know, they don't really go to the front lines that much. They tend not to become casualties that often. Three corps commanders in a battle? That's pretty crazy, honestly. So, And also, uh, Meade's losses in terms of brigade commanders, absolutely horrendous. So Meade's lost a lot of men and a lot of officers. His army is not in a condition to attack at Falling Waters. So I think it's a good thing they didn't. It would have been an absolute slaughter, I think. So, anyway, uh, uh, one thing I'm noticing looking at the map, especially on day two, I didn't realize that Yule was so far, had uh, the flank of Slocum and some of the other commanders. Yeah, 
Yeah. Because I know the part of the battle that people usually focus on in the counts is uh, what Longstreet does at um, the little round top and then with Pickett's Charge, but I I didn't know that much about Culp's Hill. Can you tell us about Culp's Hill some? Yeah, Culp's Hill was a tall, heavily wooded hill. Like, I've been on Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill is interesting to, to check out because the woods are tangled and there's just random monuments around the place. So you'll go down a trail... Or a path, and there'll just be a random monument surrounded by trees and foliage. Uh, Culp Seal is heavily wooded. Yule will attack with Edward Johnson's division. That's one of the problems that Yule has, though, is that Yule had three divisions. He had Early, Rhodes, and Johnson. Rhodes had been chewed up on July 1st, so Rhodes isn't too involved. He has to attack with one division against a core. I mean, that's not good odds. Culp Seal is very defensible, too. The fighting there was pretty damn fierce. In fact, if you had asked people uh, at Gettysburg what part of the field, battlefield they most would have remembered, it would have been Culp's Hill, not Little Round Top. The fight in Little Round Top was fierce, but it was relatively short. You know, in the twentieth Maine, I mean, you know, you got you got the novel, the Killer Angels, got the movie Gettysburg. So everybody knows twentieth Maine. But anyway, so the fight at Culp's Hill stretched on into July third. Uh, Confederate casualties were high. Early's division did not attack a Culp's Hill. They actually attacked at Cemetery Hill right nearby. They attacked at night and actually pierced the Union lines. Um, There's a case to be made that the problem with Ewell's attacks was that there was no support for them. Whatever success he had, there's nobody there to exploit it. Right, because I guess AP Hill is not really within supporting distance. No, no, he's not. And also, AP Hill's... core had been chewed up on july 1st um heath's division was the first one in they suffered heavy losses uh so had penders relatively speaking anderson's division was involved in longstreet's attack but anderson did not attack as fast as he could that said when anderson did attack his men were delayed by the first minnesota you know about this regiment no it's an epic and uh, essentially, like, Longstreet's made his attacks on the Union left flank. He hasn't crushed it, but he's inflicted heavy losses to the Union left flank. Anderson attacks. At the point that Anderson attacks, there's almost nobody in the center to stop them. And Hancock went up to one of the only reserve units he had, the 1st Minnesota, only 200 men. And he points at two Confederate brigades, which is like, I don't know, 3,000 guys. And he says, all right, you just stop them. Just delay them. All right, the order is practically murder. The first Minnesota goes in and suffers eighty percent casualties. It's one hundred and sixty like, guys in fifteen minutes. Yeah, I think it's the worst casualty percentage of any regiment in the Civil War. But their stand does delay the Confederate advance by only ten or fifteen minutes, which is enough time that Hancock needs to patch together a line to receive them. Also, this is probably one of the reasons why Lee attacked the center, is that the Confederates who attacked the center had come fairly close to breaking it. So I think Lee was like, oh, well, if it came close before, we can do it again, you know? Um, So anyway, uh, that's Gettysburg for you. Absolutely horrendous casualties. Biggest, bloodiest battle of the war. Well, there are a few that might be a little bit bigger, but none of them are bloodier. I mean, both sides lose about 23,000 men. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Any thoughts on Gettysburg? I mean, uh, I know it's a cliche, but I would say that clearly this is one of the decisive battles of the war. Uh, Lee had a chance potentially to follow up Chancellorsville, win a great victory on northern soil, and try to make up for some of the losses the Confederates were suffering in the West. And that victory did not emerge, and instead, loses big. And at, I guess after this fails, it becomes clear that the war is now the Union's to lose because they have the initiative, and it's just a matter of penetrating through and taking the remaining cities of the South. Yes, uh, this battle has a decisive impact in Europe. Whatever minor hopes there were left of France and England intervening disappear with it. Uh, Lee will never again have an army this large. This is also arguably Lee's army at its very top. Now, granted, he had some untested corps commanders like Ewell and A.P. Hill, 
but in terms of like the raw materials of his army like his soldiers by this point are veterans with high morale and experienced brigade commanders and division commanders as well so this really is lee's army at the top of its efficiency and it suffers heavy losses that are never replaced lee will never again command nearly eighty thousand troops in a battle you know within a year of a year after gettysburg he's lucky to have forty thousand in the field um so yeah it, it's yeah some people have really downplayed its strategic importance and said like oh well it really didn't change things i'm like no no but it stopped the invasion it was the exactly the kind of victory the north needed at that time um you know Gettysburg is one of the decisive battles of the war, one of the most important ones. Now, it probably did get overplayed in terms of its decisiveness. It definitely is not like the turning point of the Civil War, I would say, but a very important Union victory and comes exactly when they need it. And think about it. Let's say Vicksburg, I mean, Vicksburg Falls, right? But that could be canceled out if Lee, say, smashes me to Gettysburg, right? Right. And imagine the effect on morale, too, of having, like, a Union army in full retreat and defeat marching through northern towns, right? Like, just, <laughs> um, I don't know if it would have, like, won the war for the South, but it sure as hell wouldn't have been good news. Yeah, it would have right? created a panic in the North, and I guess a lot of the people in the North would probably expect a march on D.C., so, I mean, even if Lee had left Pennsylvania after winning the battle, at that point, the North would be very skittish about committing another army to the field. Yeah. Although, what do you think uh, he would have done if he had somehow won the battle? Because imagine, no matter what, if he wins the battle because he has to attack, his army still gets mangled pretty badly. Um. Well, um... It would depend on how he would win the battle. Let's assume he takes the heights south of Gettysburg, and they have a situation like Buford talks about in the movie, where Meade comes up and then attacks Lee's fortified positions on the hills and suffers heavy losses. Well, um, in that case, Lee can still hang out in the north, cause some more havoc, right? If he wins on July 2nd, the losses, of course, are much heavier. I still think the same thing, but maybe he stays in the north a bit shorter. And July 3rd, he can't win anyway. I mean, I mean, you know, short of some a miracle. But I don't know. I think if he wins, he just gets to hang out in the north longer, cause more mischief, you know, raid more supplies. Who knows? Maybe he threatens Philadelphia or Philadelphia or Baltimore. Probably that was one of the Chris that would cost Meade the command, though, if he lost at Gettysburg. Probably so, probably so. Uh, I do think that Beauregard had a good analysis of the uh, Lee's invasion. He said, what can Lee possibly accomplish with this raid? And while Lee could have accomplished something, I think Beauregard is making a good point with that. He can't take a town and hold it. You know, short of destroying the Union Army, which is very unlikely, uh, the most that can be said is that he can hurt Union morale and get needed supplies for Virginia. And that, by the way, is a big deal for them, too. One of the only things that would Lee and his men looked back on the Gettysburg campaign fondly was that they did get the supplies. Right? Like, they went through, like, Union... You know, northern held farms and very, very um, rich country, if you will, and came back with a lot of loot and food. Um, so they could have hung out even longer there to even further improve their supply situation. So, so I know that originally mention. they went to Gettysburg because they thought there were shoes there. Did anybody get any shoes? You know, I don't think they went there for shoes. I think that was like a story told later on. But well, that's, uh, that's don't what quote. I learned from uh, Robert E. Lee's Civil War. So I thought you learned that from Sid Meier's Gettysburg. It might have been that one because I know at, at one point uh, General Heath is talking to Lee and he said, "Sir, we're gonna go to Gettysburg tomorrow and secure some shoes." That's Sid Meier's Gettysburg. Okay, oh God, Gettysburg, that one's man. oh man, that was so great. Sid Meier's Gettysburg. They always have like the two officers talking to each other before that. Yeah, and, uh, I, I thought it was funny, though, the whole idea that basically a shopping trip for shoes 
ended up creating arguably the most important battle ever fought on the North American continent. Yeah, I gotta ask you that, man. Like, one thing is about Gettysburg, I mean, it's not the only battle like this, but it's one of the very few. It's the only big one, because most of these battles, like, at least one of the sides said, I'm gonna fight here, right? And ultimately, I guess, both decide to fight anywhere, right? Like, Stones River, like, Bragg doesn't say we're gonna retreat. He says, we're standing here and we're fighting. So Rosecrans has gotta fight him, right? Right. Uh, Shiloh, Grant didn't want to fight there, but Johnston sure as fuck did. Yeah. Gettysburg, neither general wanted to fight there. It's an accident that it happens. I mean, are there any battles in ancient history that kind of just accidentally happened? You mean encounter battles? Um, I want to say... Uh, but but, but an encounter battle an encounter that... Battle. Like, I was going to say an encounter battle that like, ballooned into this, right? Wait, which uh, battle did you say? Sinocephaly might be fit that mold. It ha I don't remember some of the details of how the battle started, but uh, the Romans were vaguely trying to find the Macedonians and look for a battle, but I'm pretty sure it started as a battle where they neither had intended to fight that day, and then somehow it blew up into the full battle. Um, the other one that is a better example, actually, now I think about it, I believe it's called Garunium, and this was mm -hmm. a battle that Fabius's Master of Horse Minucius fought against Hannibal. Although maybe Minucius provoked the battle, but I think it actually started as a bunch of uh, foragers got into a fight, and then Minucius decided to march out his army and make it a battle. And he actually won a very minor victory, but then of course Hannibal used his overconfidence against him and almost destroyed him. But uh, yeah, initially it was sort of just an accident. But aside from that, I can't think of too many others that would qualify as a battle just kind of happening and then the generals being forced into it. Um, but again, maybe Sinocephaly, but I, I'm not even very confident of that now that I think about it. Mm. Maybe Sinocephaly. Oh, okay. Although I, think, I don't know much. I think actually the Romans were looking for the Macedonians at that time. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe the Macedonians had come into the hills looking for the Romans. I forget. Or maybe each of them were trying to traverse through the mountains. I forget the details. I have to read up on that. I'm planning on doing some uh, Romans of Renown for the second century anyway, so I guess I will get there okay. when I get there. Uh, well, sir, um, we got any more Super Chats? Not so far. Um, remember, there's a oh, mystery Seth prize Becker. on the line. Oh, yeah, he did donate uh, four ninety nine, but no comment. Forgot about that. Thank you, Seth. And uh, somebody yeah. did mention the great game North and South for the NES. Yeah, that was the. I think that was game was actually made by a French company. Uh, that game's a hoot, man. It's ridiculous. Like it's, it also feels kind of like a western. Like yeah, like a part where you got to steal stuff on a train. Am I right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, that's so, one of my favorite NES games. I'm not a big NES fan, but I do like that game a lot. Yeah, people tend to dig. People dug that one a lot back then. That was a popular one. You like usually we go to the video rental store, and North and South was oftentimes rented out. Like you, 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 you didn't always get a copy of that one, right? Like, <laughs> like you like other games, you'd be like, oh yeah, there's always going to be a copy of like fucking um, God. What's a shitty game? Um, Friday the Thirteenth. Mylon's Mylon's Secret Castle. Um, Friday the Thirteenth, huh? <laughs> You know, Lance beat that game. Of course he did. That's of course, what Lance of course. does. I I kind of like that one, although I say kind of like it. I'm not saying it's the greatest game ever or anything. Um, I'm just saying, like, for an LJN game, it's pretty good. I also think it's kind of crazy that they were like, all right, for Nintendo, for kids, we're going to make a game based on a series known for blood and tits, right? Like that's what the that's what the fucking series is known for. Yeah. Oh, uh, Seth you Becker know. actually did have a comment. He just left it a little after the super chat. Oh, what's that? He said, "Hey guys, good seeing you again. The only thing I want to say is I would love to see a history of the left someday." Oh God, that's like a massive topic, man. Like Jesus Christ, that would be history one we left? might be able to divide up though into different sections. Also, I I have I mean like. I'm not so much an expert on, um, I mean, everything left-related, right? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, like, it's just, like, uh, I, I could talk about the French Revolution, and 
the left in America, but um, other stuff less able to really. I don't know. So that's a massive topic, man. Yeah. Uh, someone, uh, Stanley Rogowski, says that there was a really old Union Army veteran in 1948 who voted for Lincoln and Eisenhower. Although Eisenhower wasn't running in 48, so. Maybe he maybe he did him as a write in candidate. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, that's a, a pretty big spread for anybody's voting career. I mean, going from. Otherwise, it's, otherwise it's Thomas E. Dewey. Yeah, it had to be Dewey unless unless he voted for Truman or maybe he wrote an Ike. I don't know. Yeah, he could have wrote an Ike, you know, he could have run an Ike. I don't know, was Ike even considering in 1948? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean... I don't think so either. I remember Eisenhower played around with being Republican or Democrat for a period of time before he finally uh, settled in. Yeah, I think uh, he thought that uh, initially I think he was more leaning toward running as a Democrat because he thought the party was in better shape. Uh, so he thought maybe Truman would collapse due to unpopularity and whatnot, and then he could step in and take the nomination, but that didn't happen. Mm. That does remind me, everybody. Um, next weekend, we're going to have our extravaganza. We would go over, we do a tier ranking list, going old school again, over the people who did not win the presidency. Um, not everybody will be on that list. You had to get 10% or more of the popular vote. Um, if you happen to lose a presidential race but win another one, so if you're like Martin Van Buren or Richard Nixon, we're not talking about you. This is only men who ran and never got the thing. Right, so we have 42 people to get through, so that one will be long. That's going to be a fucking beast, but be there, be ready. I uh, can't wait for it. This one's going to be awesome. Yeah, we got a lot of good stuff for this one. There are some pretty interesting people and campaigns to talk about. And actually, two of the people we mentioned in passing today will show up there. John C. Breckenridge and also Winfield Scott Hancock. Correct, correct. I've got my particular thoughts on Hancock's um, uh, presidential run as well. Uh, but I can't wait to talk about James oh, G. Blaine. So three of three people who are on that list. Actually. That's right, McClellan. Yeah, so three. Are you ready to talk about James G. Blaine? I'm thrilled to talk about James G. Blaine. I mean, he's one of the greatest politicians to ever live. Uh, you know, he actually was one of the greatest politicians of his era. <laughs> well, um, I, feel like, I feel like his fans were called Blaineyacks. <laughs> yeah, there. Uh, the one thing I did find interesting uh, throughout a lot of American history, and maybe you know the answer to this, or maybe somebody in chat does. So, from the early Republic... North New England has always been, it had been Federalist, then it was Whig, then it was Republican, and then I think it was what in the seventies maybe it finally became Democrat. Uh, does anybody know Roughly. exactly how that happened? Because it was a fairly uh, conservative place for most of its history until fairly recently, and then it just switched pretty suddenly. Uh, you know, though, I, you say conservative, but I mean, the Federalists there's were a... kind of big government conservatives, the Whigs, although on social issues, definitely more liberal, but I think economically they were more conservative from what I understand. The Whigs, uh, yeah, they just the, um, I mean, <laughs> New England is... New England, for Americans, I would say New England is the land of the authoritarian left. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the authoritarian left. Because in some ways, Puritans are kind of left wing for their time. I mean, they're reform minded and everything, but you know, they're not like left libertarians. You're gonna have like blue laws and stuff. Um, you're gonna have things like witch hunts and whatnot. And so. I, I do feel that New England, I mean, you can find all sorts of left-wing ideas in New England in the 1800s. I mean, after all, it's the hotbed of abolitionism, isn't it? But also prohibitionism. Right. And, you know, prohibitionism, we view it as this failure, but it is it is a left progressive ideal. The idea that we can get rid of alcohol and that'll improve society. Now, 
getting rid of slavery, we all agree that improves society, but we don't agree that getting rid of alcohol improves society, right? Right. You know, so I, I that's just my feeling. I, I feel like I feel like New England's the home of like the authoritarian moralizing left, if you will. Um but yeah, this the the um anyway, I'm sorry. So that's just some random thoughts I had about that one. Um yeah, I don't know. Just like uh, their shift towards being Democrats seems to have really occurred. I guess the 1930s. I mean, I know like Vermont kept going consistently Republican, but some of that also is just the fact that Vermont had been a Republican stronghold for decades on decades, right? Right. And keeping in mind, too, that the, the parties back then, of course, had dedicated conservative and liberal wings. So a lot of party loyalty was less ideologically consistent and more had to do with region, ethnicity, and other stuff as well. Uh, one thing I'm really running into reading about the 1884 election is that the uh, Democratic Party of the Gilded Age is a very local party in its orientation. A Democrat in louisiana is not the same as a democrat in new york they have a lot they they i mean they have they have a few ideas in common but there's a lot that differentiate differentiates them and that's something too right now we have a lot of party discipline i would say for the most part you don't have it as much in the gilded age i run into a lot of politicians where i'm like oh this person like has different views on one given subject or another you know so anyway Anyway, we got one more chat here from uh, Seth, I see. It's, um, he said, uh, he added the comment, yes, yeah, shit, oh, the yeah. history of the American left, that'd be beautiful, and also get Danny to predict its future and look into his crystal ball. <laughs> um, I can tell you what Danny thinks can happen with the American left. Uh, he thinks its future is a joke that it's been infested with woke capitalism and that it's going to become a capitalist party. It's essentially going to continue to metastasize as a capitalist, culturally radical uh, party. Or I'm not saying that party, but like force. Uh, that's what he thinks the future, that's what he thinks is the future of the American left. Um, anyway, I don't know, I can't speak to that. Uh, the one thing I'll leave you with is that George Orwell had a good point, is that uh, there's this tendency with people to believe that whatever is going on right now must continue to go on. That there is no way that any, there's no way there can be a trend against it. But we all know that, you know, things can turn on a dime, right? Yeah, it's so, like the belief in the demographic argument. Exactly, exactly. And I, I mention this because... While, of course, the type of left that Danny is talking about is ascendant right now, I would not want to say that definitively that is what's going to dominate the Democratic Party and the left. But it certainly does for the time being. I mean, identity issues are the moral center of the Democratic Party and the left for the time being. Could be different in 10 years. I have my doubts, but it could be. Never say never. Anyway, I should probably call it quit soon. I got to wake up in the morning for a garden dist garden district tour. Uh, so I got two tours tomorrow. Oh, it's it's a it's a part of New Orleans where they got like a lot of big nice homes and stuff. Um, the Americans settled there after the Louisiana Purchase and built themselves very fine homes. Historically, a wealthy neighborhood. Nice one to walk around in. Lots of oak trees, you know. So I do a garden district tour tomorrow. Um, and then after that, talk to a guy about a podcast, do a crime tour, and then watching The Exorcist at the movie theater. Oh, wow. It's a pretty busy yeah. schedule then for Sean tomorrow. Yeah, man. Just stay busy. It's been a busy week or so, you know. Although, like I was telling you earlier, man, shit feels weird Man, people are doing weird stuff right now. They are seem like they got more of a fuck it attitude. I guess everybody's really nervous with the election coming up. You know, I mean, hell, I, I, I feel in the pit of my stomach. I think it's going to be terrible. 
Well, I think we're about ready. How about the? I've felt that way ever really since the Democratic primary was decided because no matter what happens, it's going to suck. I did too, man. I was at the bar. We were doing trivia. I I was got really drunk. And I was like, "Fuck, it's fuck. It's gonna be Biden. Fuck, man. Fuck." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> it's. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what to say. There's, it's just. Uh... <sighs> I wish I could say I something that would be uplifting. I guess one thing I did read that I guess you could consider uplifting, I'm almost done with the book now, uh, it is David Runciman's The Confidence Trap, which is a history of democracy done with crisis. And his central thesis is essentially that the strength of democracy is flexibility and adaptability, that democracy makes tons and tons of mistakes, but that it always somehow finds a way out by muddling through. So... If you believe that, right. and he's sort of doubtful about it, but he says that historically that's kind of what's happened. So I guess if you do believe that, then somehow we'll muddle through this. But exactly how that happens, fuck only knows. Um, I don't know, but you know what I think about, though? That liberal democracy survived the two world wars and the Cold War. So it defeated the monarchs, the fascists, and the communists, right? Sure. But it appears that lacking some grand enemy like that, it's not very good at surviving. At I least in its current form. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we'll see. Oh, um, we still have to I know I, pick a winner. Hmm? Right now, uh, Michael Klein is in the lead by two cents for today's prize. I think that it will be Michael Klein then. Yeah. Unless somebody wants to try to get a steal real fast. <laughs> and I, actually, I don't know, man. I, I, I are you picking the prize or am I? Um, yeah, I can send something off. Yeah, I got some. I got some stuff. I got some history books. All right, so it will be a history book of some kind or other. Apparently, uh, somebody else answered our inquiry about New England. They said that it has to do with Irish immigration into New England, and then the Republicans and know nothings, sort of having an anti-Catholic bent. Now Seth Becker has taken the lead. This is actually very true. Michael the, Klein, uh, you have lost the lead. Seth Becker, you have <laughs> taken the lead. Uh, this is actually very true. That comment is very true. The Irish immigrants were won over by the Democratic Party. And yes, the Republican Party had a... They weren't an explicitly anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic party in the Gilded Age, but they always played around with it. They always flirted with it. Um, even a guy like Grant would occasionally make speeches where there'd be like insults thrown at Catholics, for instance. But it was never like explicitly part of the platform. It was more like uh, occasionally like, oh, you know, we just kind of do this thing sometimes. We talk shit about Catholics. But that's enough to make sure Catholics vote Democrat, which I will mention, that was a summer's class. We're talking about the Gilded Age, and he asked everybody at the table, like, which political party would they support? And everybody said Republicans. And they got to me, and I said Democrat. They were like, what? And I was like, well, I'd, I'd be in... I'd be an Irish immigrant. I mean, I'm going to back the Democrats. I mean, you know, they're they're pro-immigration. They're pro-alcohol. Huh. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they're pro-Catholic. Oh, that's that's that name of the summer's book, Rum, Romanism, and Rebellion. That's um, a reference to the 1884 election. That's what, what somebody said that the Democratic Party was nothing essentially but alcoholism, Catholicism, and secession. So, rum, Romanism, and rebellion. <laughs> well, uh, somewhat accurate, I guess. Um, somewhat accurate, man. I'm definitely in, firmly in favor of two of those, and even secession. I mean, if it, I mean, the South didn't have good cause, but you know, if other people have good cause, I I don't see why secession's wrong if the cause is right. Yeah. You also, know? Uh, Vaza says that's a very British outlook. Just muddle through. It is. And it is, yeah. Also, uh, David Runciman is British, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, that's right. No, the British are saying, yep, just muddle through. Like, we're not nearly as viciously efficient as some of these fuckers, right? But no, we'll just muddle through. Also, uh, <laughs> like, Seth we'll make... wants you to know that he's looking for a book, hopefully not about the Civil War, and preferably about the left in some way. Oh, um... What about one that's about both? <laughs> I guess we'll um, see what he says my, in a second. Well, well, all I can say is one of my favorite books about the American left is actually The Inner Civil War, which is about 
northern intellectuals dealing with the consequences of the civil war and dealing with the um the i guess you would say the military virtues created by the war and essentially the book is trying to say like why did the left reformers lose power at the moment of their greatest victory the victory against slavery oh uh, then very soon after yes yeah, Stanley has a good point here. Chileans and Bolivians have been winning victories recently for uh, the left. So there have been some pretty major leftist victories in South America. And, um, yeah, I unfortunately have not had time to look into that in much detail, but that is some exciting stuff. Uh, another thing that's exciting that we forgot to talk about, I wanted to get your take really fast, Sean. What do you think of Rudy Giuliani's latest scandal? Oh, I, I heard about it, but I, I don't know much about it at all. So uh, something to do with Borat, right? Yeah, Borat is making another movie, and one of the women who works for him was posing as his daughter. She was pretending to be 15, but she's actually 20-something. And so she went into a hotel room with Giuliani, and apparently he unzipped his pants and shoved his hand down his pants. And then so Borat had to run in. And his line was, no, 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 Mr. Giuliani. She's 15. She's far too old for you. And then he shut that down. And apparently oh this will be in the new movie and it's featured. So uh, there's footage of this. Uh, I, I haven't seen it. I don't really have an opinion. I'm not too surprised as far as that goes. Uh, but I, I kind of subscribe to that idea that the, um, that the people who are in power can just they they i mean they can have whatever they want so of course they want things that are strictly forbidden such as 15 year olds right you yeah, know what i mean I don't, like, I don't know if he actually said that she was 15 but I, I know that was supposed to be her official age as a kazakhstani reporter or whatever there was something about her being 15 but anyway giuliani i guess because they went in the hotel room he, he just like oh let's get it on and i'm not sure if she came on to him or not but just I mean I don't know man like like me and Liz used to say the aristocrats are evil like that's you know the aristocrats are evil all right they are that's why uh, they modeled vampires after aristocrats yeah exactly uh no I, I don't have much of an opinion on it I do think it's hilarious though that Giuliani would be involved in a Borat movie well they, he tries because... to interview people who are kind of hapless and fall for his shtick I mean he also got Pat Buchanan in the past in his first movie actually that was the Oli G show he interviewed Pat Buchanan and asked him about WMDs but he changed the acronym to BLTs and then uh, Pat Buchanan went along and he was like well you know we gotta find the BLTs and then eventually he, he looked up and he thought about it for a second and then he smiled because he knew he'd messed up at least he was a good sport about it but most of these guys no, I remember, I remember get pissy that. or whatever I remember watching that Pat Buchanan was like a really was a good sport about it but he I mean he would be like honestly, I think so. yeah, yeah. I, I'm not surprised by that. I I could totally see Pat Buchanan being like, you know what? Yeah, you know, you got me. It's fun. <laughs> I mean, he's Pat fucking Buchanan. You know, he's he's a drinker, or whatever. Um, oh, what was the other one he interviewed? Who was that guy? He was on 60 Minutes. Andy Rooney. Maybe you ever saw that interview? Um, uh, I don't think so. It, it, Andy Rooney just gets pissed at him and is like, use proper English. Like, he just, he has no fucking patience at all. It's kind of hilarious. Like, Andy Rooney will not play along at all. <laughs> yeah, I love the people uh, who get pissed off at him. And actually, if anything, I think his Oli G character was better than Inspiring Anger. Whereas with Borat, people are afraid that there's a cultural misunderstanding, so they're way too nice and accommodating. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Whereas I remember uh, no, one I, time it looked like Kobe was going to murder him. And also there was one he did with Shaq where Shaq almost murdered him. Because he kept trying to argue with Shaq that the NBA stood for National Basketball League. <laughs> and then, um, Shaq wouldn't murder him? Holy yeah, fuck, you could man. just tell because Shaq was getting angry. And uh, he also got under Kobe's skin. This is before Kobe had a sense of humor uh, where he said something to the effect of you know, so you say the ball bounces because it's full of air, but this room's full of air and it's not bouncing, so uh, as if he had made a great point. And Kobe just gave him this stare, 
where it, it wasn't clear whether he was just disappointed or whether he was thinking of murdering uh, his character, which I think was Ali G for that interview. Ken Cook <laughs> has entered the fray again. Four ninety nine. Rudy Giuliani is Nosferatu. Biden is the mummy. Thank you, Ken Cook. Uh, I've heard that people have told me. People have told me Rudy Giuliani is Nosferatu many times. What do you think? Uh yeah, I agree. I, he does look like Nosferatu pretty closely. I can't argue yeah. against that. And to be fair, I've not seen the two of them in different rooms, so. It's possible they are the same person. I think he's gotten more Nosferatu over time, right? Yeah, as he's aged, he's become yeah. more Nosferatu. But even if you look at young Rudy, you can still see it. Oh, yeah. I do think Biden is the mummy. Uh, God, but what does that make Trump? A golem? I don't know what Trump is. Trump might be an alien. Um... Ken Cook, by the way, you have taken the lead, sir, with just under 11 bucks. Let's see, is that right? No, 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 just under 12 bucks. So you're 11.97. Seth Becker, 4.99. Let's see. That puts you possibly back in the lead. And apparently the new president of Chile is kind of hot, from what people are saying, and she's pretty young. Well, like the one, remember the one from Ukraine years back? What was her name? She ended up in jail. No. She was cute. She was cute, man. So Seth Becker's now in the lead at uh, 12.96, I believe. He says he wants the stupid book. You want the, Seth wants the stupid book? I mean, I send you a stupid book i mean if you're sure about that <laughs> yeah i mean um, i have a book here that predicts that 2006 to 2010 will be the greatest economic boom in history so if you're looking for a stupid book i can hook you up speaking of that i ran to some i i put this book on a reading list i had it was called convergence of catastrophes it was written by like a far right guy in france and the reason i was interested in the book was that he said that uh, you know there's going to be a convergence of things that would undermine Western civilization, and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But this is what interested me about it. He said 2020 is the year when it all would come to fruition, and he wrote this in like 2003. Damn. So I put the book on my Goodreads list, and I waited till 2020, went to it, and I tried to read it, and it was fucking terrible. Although his analysis was okay but his predictions were pretty good but i just didn't like the writing style and there's a bunch of other stuff i didn't like about it either you know but yeah i was like i was like holy shit this guy actually uh yeah yeah good good job mr fay you uh you weren't too far off in the prediction game overall but anyway you want to go on and call it close to things sir yeah we'll call it i guess we'll give it maybe another Five minutes Five for minutes? the sake of fairness. Yeah, so 2.10 sure will be the cutoff date. Even if you do donate past that time, it won't count toward the prize, but maybe it'll count toward the next one just to make things as fair as humanly possible. Yeah. But no, man. The uh, I didn't know about the Giuliani thing. I did look at the uh, Hunter Biden stuff. Now I hear there's a sex tape. For Giuliani? Um, no, for Hunter Biden. Oh, okay. I didn't hear about that. Yeah, well, they were talking about screw-up sons, like, you know, the Trumps versus Hunter Biden. I'm like, I prefer Hunter Biden much more. I mean, sex tapes, smoke and crack, sounds way more entertaining. Yeah, actually, I agree, I agree with Chapo Trap House. We needed the sons debate. It could be a two-on-one, Hunter versus Eric and Don Jr. <laughs> How is Chapo been... Trap House lately? Um, I haven't seen it lately, but I used to listen to them a lot more. I know they had a hiatus because they had some sort of struggle between Virgil Texas and Matt Chrisman, and that sort of split up the group for a little while. And mm. Matt Chrisman won, and Virgil went his own way. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I don't... more of a fan of Virgil than Matt, but uh, apparently I think well, Matt he... might be the guy who started it, and he seems to hold the power. He's one of those guys, he's great in an ensemble, but by himself he's kind of difficult to listen to. 
Yeah, I, I never listened to them that much. I know they're part of what they called the dirtbag left. Left. Um, I kind of feel that uh, a lot of this is like that post, um, you know, Sanders lost hangover, if you will, <laughs> where, you know, your Marxist material left is in this awkward position right now where they really feel like outsiders because they are. Which I also mention because you get those guys like, you know, like Mencius Molberg and distribute us who are like, oh, you know, the left always wins. And I'm like, are you kidding me? On economics, the right wing's been kicking ass for the last 40 fucking years. You yeah. know, this this idea that we're always going left, I'm like, economically, that is total bullshit. Um, but at any rate, uh, I was just wondering how they were doing, considering that uh, you know it's the the election is like their nightmare, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, are they like Noam Chomsky? Are they out there uh, like uh, hawking for uh, Biden right now? I did see that Noam Chomsky interview with that. Uh, who was it? It was uh, actually Virgil, who had left Chapo, and then his new ho- co-host. I don't remember her name right offhand. Yeah, she used to work. She worked in the Sanders campaign. Uh, oh, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, she. I I know who you're talking about now. I forgot it was her, but yeah, she's a fairly big name on the left. God, Virgil had the great line. He's like, "This is this is the problem with anarchists." <laughs> That's yeah. what I know. He's like, the "Problem with anarchists." I'm like, I'm like, wow. I, I didn't. I I I I love this like secretarian secretarian, um, esoteric, interleft debate stuff. Like this is the problem with anarchists. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually you, part of why I like Virgil so much is that uh, he's very dry but still funny as shit. God, that's the thing. It's like, like they'd be like, "Oh fuck," they'll be like, you know, like uh, Trotsky, Stalin. No man, neither. Mao. <laughs> it's so esoteric, man. <laughs> uh, Ken Cook, nine ninety nine. You're now in the lead. Use. I don't know. What thank that you, means, Ken. But uh, I don't know what it means you. either. But thank. you. Uh, no, man, there's so, um, the Chapo Trap House thing, uh... Yeah, I would, I would say check it out. I think you'd like it. Okay, well, so, so, what'd you think of the Noam... Did you watch that Noam Chomsky thing where he's talking about, like, Clips. Uh, you know, about your grandkids being underwater and stuff, which, I don't know, man, it, uh, yeah. it, it's kind of hard Noam Chomsky lately because I'm always like, this is a very, very old man, you know? I mean... The thing about Noam Chomsky, one thing I find interesting, especially in the larger context of dealing with a lot of very old candidates who are clearly lost a step, he's also lost a step, but at least he had stuff to lose to begin with, so he's still sharp enough to have a meaningful conversation. Although, clearly yeah. he's not as sharp as he once was, but still, he's he's a big boy. So I know there are people who attacked him, or attacked uh, the new podcast for fighting back. Because it's like, well, he's an old man, and he's Noam Chomsky. He's a big deal. But, I mean, Noam is still able to cover up. He's not completely defenseless. And uh, he's he's been saying a lot of the same stuff for a while, because he always ends up coming back to, uh, we well, we got to back the Democrats, I guess. I don't see a better alternative. And uh, to be fair, I mean, his contribution about media bias was great enough that I'll forgive him having bad strategy. Uh, you know, not everybody has to be the man on every topic. Yeah, well, that's one of our problems right now is that everybody's got, everybody's got to be the man. Yeah, I right? mean, and it's it's fine to just be good at one thing. There's no there's no shame in being a specialist. All right, so we got a pretty heated race. It's now officially over. Lots of last minute contributions. Let me make the final calculation to make sure we get a decisive winner here. So, okay, so uh, thank you, Seth Becker, and thank you, Ken Cook. Yes, thank you for making this a race. It's more interesting than the Biden Trump election for sure. So, Ken, just under 27, so probably like 26, 95, something along those lines. And Seth. Twenty-four for Seth. So Seth came pretty close, but Ken Cook wins by virtue of the Electoral College. 
and therefore he is the new winner of the week and will receive a book from Sean. So you will need to get in contact with Sean so you can get your mailing information. Yeah, Ken. Um, if you're on the uh, Discord, you can send me a message. If not, uh, email Thersites, and I'll get through to you that way. Okay, but I'll uh, and let me know if you want like a uh, joke book or you want a good book. But I've got some books. Okay. All right. So thank you everybody for showing up and participating. And remember, next week is the big one. We're going through all of the previous election losers in American history, at least people who got up to 10% of the vote and never won. So a lot of people you probably heard of, some you might not have, and you will get to learn about how they fared as presidential candidates. So pretty interesting. A lot of them were pretty major figures in our nation's history and people who should not be forgotten. So until next yes, time, yes. I'm Thersites, he's Sean, good night. All right. All right, man. Oh, yeah, for... Uh...